And I would like to introduce Karen McFarland. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the inaugural LA Stage Talk. So I'm thrilled to have uh, everyone here with us this morning. Um, I want to thank Senator Theater Griffin and, and everyone here for hosting us at the Kirk Douglas Theater. Where, uh, we were originally going to be in our first movie, and because there are so many of you here, we are live in the theater, which seems an appropriate kickoff to this series. Um, on behalf of the staff and board of LA Stage, welcome. I want to thank our sponsors, without whom we would not be here. The Terry Hustler Family Foundation, California Community Foundation. Yeah, we can have shout out to the <laughs> sponsors, right? Uh, LA County Arts Commission, uh, Los Angeles Department of Social Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, the James Irvine Foundation, Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, and the Schubert Foundation. Um, I want to remind everyone that today is World Theater Day. You received a handout, and there's also more information at TCG.org. We welcome our live stream audience as well. Hello, everyone, on the interwebs. Um, why is this topic important, the intrinsic impact of theater? For those of us that work in service organizations or advocacy, we're always looking for new ways to talk about what it is that we do, how it, how it works in our brains, how it works in our bodies, how it sort of uh, situates art and theater in the context of daily life, sort of uh, civic life, um, community, those types of things. And a few years back, I was in a NAMP session uh, in Miami, I think it was, right? Um, hearing about Alan's work with the major university presenters and kind of, I think, the first round of intrinsic impact work that was, that was happening. There have been many subsequent iterations of that, um, most notably locally with the Irvine Foundation and uh, the Inland Empire, I think. Um, and so when I got the call from Clay and Brad at the Peter Bay area that they had received funding from the George Street Foundation to do a national project, we jumped at the chance to be a part of it. Uh, sort of dove in head first. We didn't have time to, to fundraise specifically for it, but we decided it would be really important to include our partners, um, and, and uh, you'll hear more about them, but a sort of a wide variety of uh, theaters participating in it, with Theater Boston Court, South Coast Rep, and Musical Theater West. Um, so we're really happy to be, to be a part of it, and you'll hear, you'll hear more about the findings. Um, but I think what it will help us to do is kind of change the, the tenor of the dialogue about how it is we talk about what we do. Um, but you'll tell me about that. That's what I think. Um, this is the beginning of this intrinsic impact work locally. Um, there will be more ways for other uh, arts organizations in the region to participate. We'll be hearing about those. Um, and as I said at the top, this is the first of our LA Stage Talk series. The next um, one will be April 30th at 7 p.m. on the subject, a very uh, contentious subject of arts criticism. <laughs> How does it serve Los Angeles? And it's co hosted by the Southern California Public Radio um, uh, Network. So, in terms of questions, if you're here live in the audience, at any point, raise your hand. We'd like for this to be an interactive dialogue. For those of you on live stream, we're taking questions on the LA Stage Alliance Facebook account, as well as Twitter. Our hashtag is LA Stage Talks, which is why I'll have this little device, and I'll be moderating those questions as we go through. Um, first, today you'll be hearing from uh, both Alan Brown, who's a principal at Wolf Brown, leading market research and arts consulting company for our arts and culture organization. Um, I like to think that Alan lives in the sweet spot between data and the arts, and, and certainly a fellow data geek, so happy to have him amongst us. And a good friend and colleague from uh, up north of the Bay Area, Clayton Lord, who's the Director of Communications and Audience Development there. It's a service organization, it's kind of our sister organization up in the uh, Bay Area. They serve about 350 member uh, theater and dance companies and over 3,000 individual members uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. And a little bit later, we'll be introducing um, our friends from Theater Boston Court, who are Stick Director Jessica Kuzanski, the Musical Theater West Marketing Director Michael Betts, and South Coast Repertories Director of Marketing Bill uh, Schroeder. So I want to thank them for all for participating in the study, and with that, I will pass over to Clayton Lord. Okay. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Clayton Lord. I'm the Director of Communications and Audience Development at Theater Bay Area. Um, and uh, Theater Bay Area, as, as Terrence was pointing out, is a regional service organization like LA Stage. Um, we focus specifically on theater and dance artists in the San Francisco Bay Area, which makes us a bit of an odd fit to be leading a national project. Um, and so uh, I hope that as much as you get anything else out of this, you also um, can, can, at the end of this uh, kind of presentation, understand 
uh, the amount of passion that we feel that we have actually, um, in some ways, stepped outside of our core mission on the goal, uh, with the goal of actually um, enhancing a national conversation that will ultimately come back to our local membership and to all of the memberships um, of theater companies, theater individual artists, theater administrators throughout the country. Um, so, where's, oh, there we go. Welcome. <laughs> Agenda. Uh, so, this is three hours. Here, I'll stand here, it's closer to the computer. So it's three hours, so this is the first part. 75 minutes and then we give you a break, don't worry. Um, in the first part, um, I'm going to start out by, by talking to you a little bit about what intrinsic impact is and why you should care about it. Um, and, and also to go through uh, some of our principal partners and, and kind of give you a little bit of a history of how we got where we are. And then Alan is actually going to talk through um, measuring the intrinsic impact of live theater, which is the, the research report that Wolf Brown generated at the end of doing their year long research project for us. Um, and then we'll have a section of QA. And, and actually, as Terrence was saying, throughout the process, if you have questions that come up, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, we do want this to be a conversation, otherwise, it's going to be a really long three hours. So then we take a 10 minute break, we come back. And we talked for about 45 minutes with representatives from the three theater companies that participated in the study. Um, in this case, that's Theater at Boston Court, South Coast Rep, and Bristol, uh, no, it's not Bristol Riverside. Uh -oh. We forgot to change it. Uh, it's, it's Musical Theater West is the third one. Sorry, we've been doing this presentation. This is now the seventh one we've done in two weeks. So it's, it's interesting to, to see the little hiccups we take. But um, all of these companies deserve a tremendous round of applause because they did an amazing amount of work in order to get this data. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But this was not, this was not a low-key process for any of them. Um, they devoted a lot of their time and energy and also a lot of just straight-up manpower putting surveys out, getting surveys back. Um, and, and making sure that their audiences were engaging in, in this process. And then we'll have a discussion with the, the, the theater company representatives about the benefits and limitations of impact assessment and indeed of assessment of any kind. Um, how, do you, how do you assess your audiences and what does and does not that tell you about them? And then in the third section, we'll, we'll have a conversation about um, why we should or should not engage audiences in critical feedback, what it does for their artistic experience, um, how it can benefit them, how it can benefit the organization. We'll talk about the long arc of impact assessment as well as practical applications that we are experiencing out of this work and we hope will continue over time. Um, we'll have another section of question and answer if we need it. If you guys have been asking your questions throughout, we might just blow through that. And then um, we'll talk about engaging the field at large in impact assessment, which is Peter Bay Area's um, kind of next step in this process is to, to take what has been a research project and turn it into something that is actually being used actively every day in the field. Um, and then we'll have concluding remarks, which is me changing the conversation. All right, so some quick housekeeping. Um, the executive summary is um, available online. Uh, as, it, as are a variety of different excerpts from this work. It's possible you also got a handout with the executive summary if you didn't take a look at it online. Um, the books are available in the lobby, and, and we are only able to do a real high gloss on um, all of the research that went into this. This was a two-year research project. We ended up with 20 interviews with artistic directors, four interviews with really high-impact patrons, um, uh, Alan Brown and Rebecca Ratzman's research report, which is a compilation of over 19,000 survey responses, as well as four original essays. So you get the high-gloss version, and there are excerpts available online, but if you do want the whole thing, feel free, um, please, to, to take a look at the book, purchase the book, and, and, um, and read it. Uh, my email address is clay at peterbayarea.org. That um, will come into play later uh, if you're interested in doing this work for yourselves, um, because the best way to do that is to email me, and I'll put you on the list, and, and as we move forward with this work, uh, we will make sure to get in touch with you. You can find a bunch of free information at these two websites, theaterbayarea.org slash intrinsicimpact or intrinsicimpact.org. Um, intrinsicimpact.org actually has a bibliography of all of the previous work that's been done here, including links to all of those previous studies. Um, it's a great primer on what intrinsic impact is, what it means, and why it's useful. And then finally, um, hashtag. So on top of your LA stage hashtag, if you're tweeting about this, we'd love it if you'd use the new beans tag. It's been a great conversation that's been going on for the last couple weeks. Lots and lots of participants, and um, if you don't use the hashtag, then we won't know that you're tweeting about us, and that makes us sad. So, with that, who am I?
<laughs> so um, I already told you my title, and I told you where I work. But I actually want to talk to you a little bit about something else, which is about Max. So Max, this is Max. Hopefully all of you know who he is. This is Max. He's, he's from Where the Wild Things Are. And when I was four and a half years old, I was cast as Max in my preschool's production of Where the Wild Things Are. And it was the first time that I had experienced theater in any way that I can remember. And um, I didn't really know what was going on. It was kind of a group, um, group exercise for our teacher, so she made sure that everyone understood that trees were important and shrubs were important. And, and so that's what I told my mother, and I didn't actually tell her that I was Max. And so she was very, very upset. When she got there, she didn't have her camera, and I ran out on stage and I was the star of the show. But for me, it wasn't about being the star of the show. It was about the whole artistic impact of that on my life. It's one of the only memories I have of being that young. And that is how I became passionate about art. I mean, it's the first step in a long series of steps that have led me to believe that art can change lives. And so I eventually ended up working for Theatre Bay Area, which has this mission statement, which is to unite, strengthen, promote, and advance the theatre community of the Bay Area, working on behalf of our conviction that the performing arts are an essential public good, critical to a healthy and truly democratic society, and invaluable as a source of personal enrichment and growth. And for me, the parts that really stuck with me were these. Essential public good, democratic society, personal enrichment and growth. And so when I came there as a communications director, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? We're going to communicate this. This is what we want to talk about. This is the important stuff. And then we started trying to do that, and we realized it's really hard. Like, it's, you just don't quite have the language, especially when you're talking to the people that we wanted to communicate with most, which are the people who are in our governments, the people who are at our foundations, the people who are on our boards, the people who maybe touch the art in a particular way but honestly don't come out of a lifetime of artistic experience, and so need something other than the stories we can tell about being four and a half years old and being mass to get them through. So we started asking some questions of our audience, of our patrons, our companies. <coughs> And so this is the audience, part, first audience participation part. I'm going to ask you the same questions. What does the best art do? When you see a really great production, or a piece of visual art, or a piece of music, what does it do to you? It moves your emotions. It makes you feel. It moves your emotions. Yeah. It makes you think. It makes you think. Good. It makes you see or experience something in a different way. It makes you understand another experience that's not your own. Okay. Cool. So this is Barry Levine. He is an everyday patron, except that he's what we call a super patron in the Bay Area. He goes to over a hundred live arts events a year, which is awesome. We love him. But this is what he said when, when I, I was interviewing him about a production of Journey's End that he saw in London. Journey's End, if you don't know, is a play about a bunch of soldiers in World War I who basically spend the entire play with this threat of having to go over the barricades and essentially die um, in the back of their minds, and then at the end of the play they do. It's really cheerful. And um, what he's talking about is the emotional experience of a curtain call, which um, they, they basically, instead of coming out to applause, they dropped a curtain of all of the names of people who had died in World War I, and the cast stood silently in front of it. So this is what he says. He says, the experience was just amazing. The emotional impact, it's bringing tears to my eyes right now, three or more years later. You would just walk out of there like, wow, you got bam, you got hit like that. And in the inarticulate last part there is the problem that we have today in our battle. This guy goes to see a lot of art, and that's the best that he can do. And I think it's right on point. But what's even more on point is watching this guy cry three years later, thinking about something that happened to him in the theater. How do you know your work is doing that to people? Who's artistic director here? Do you ever sit in your audiences? Why? How do you know? By watching them. Okay. Who stands in lobbies? Why? To be in an authentic relationship with them. To be in an authentic relationship with them. So basically to talk to them. To, to kind of communicate with them about what they're experiencing. Inside and outside. Okay. 
So Oscar Eustace, who's the artistic director of the public, echoed a sentiment that was said a lot of different times in a lot of different interviews, which is basically to say, I sit in the audience and I listen, and that's enough for me. I've spent my entire life in the theater, and that is the most accurate I've ever been able to judge an audience. That's basically what he says. And it's, it's true. When you've spent your life in the theater, whether you're an actor or a director or a designer, you know at the first, that, you know, an actor friend once told me that he knew by the way that the audience responded to the very first joke of the play whether it was going to be a good night or a bad night. From the patron's side, this is another power patron, his name is Sean McKenna. And he says, the way I can tell it's a moving production is it makes a tingle run through my entire body. And then he says the second part, which is, it doesn't happen always, it doesn't happen often, but it happens often enough that I know it's going to happen again. <laughs> which sounds like a drug trip to me. <laughs> and honestly, it's the same basic metaphor, right? We're trying to get people to experience as much as they can so that they want to experience it again later. They want to pursue it. Even if they go through a hundred mediocre productions, they think that they're, that they're going to get back to that memory that they have of that perfect production in their lives. So you got that. So how do you convey that to other people? Let's say patron, uh, funders, or government officials, or board members. Get them to the theater. To get them to the theater, that's good. Okay, sometimes that absolutely can do it. What else? Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> what does that mean? I go on there every morning saying something. Okay. I'm putting it out there to our Okay. So you're telling stories about people's experiences? Yeah. So you're using anecdote. Yeah. Pass those quotes on other people. You pass the quotes that other people have on other people. Yeah. Do you ever use numbers? In grant reports, maybe? You talk about how many people came, how much they spent. Maybe if you're talking to a government official, you talk about how much they spent at the restaurant down the street. <laughs> yeah. This is Diane Ragsdale. She used to work at the Mellon Foundation. She's now a, a blogger at Jumper, artsjournal.com slash jumper. You should be reading it if you're not. It's amazing. And, and this is a, from an essay in the book. It's a very long quote, but basically what it says is if we keep using the ranking mechanism that we've been using, which is basically um, the numbers that we convey about our success, then you're always going to have the same rankings. But there are a lot of other ways to think about what you do. And if, if people started talking about who generates community-wide dis discourse, or who are artistic innovators, or who is changing lives with their work, then maybe the hierarchy would get disrupted in a way that would positively impact the whole system. This is Nicki Minaj and Anna Winter. <laughs> Nicki Minaj is a music superstar. Anna Winter is the editor-in-chief of Vogue. For some reason, they were sat next to each other at a fashion show. As you can tell, Nicki Minaj created her outfit from Michael's. And in this case, Nicki Minaj kind of represents anecdote. Nicki Minaj, her outfit is free-flowing, it's non-specific, it's very idiosyncratic, it's colorful, it's eye-catching. But then Anna Winter represents the numbers. She may be kind of boring, but you can tell she's got the power and look at the size of that necklace. <laughs> and here's the problem. They don't look like they really go together, much as they might. And even more than that, when you get down to it, whether you're talking about advocacy, or you're talking about internal communications, or you're talking about fundraising, or you're talking about board oversight, the numbers tend to win out. And the, the reason is because in all of those situations, the numbers of the things that the people who, say, have the control over purse strings are interested in hearing more about. So, right now, as artists and arts administrators, we've turned ourselves into bean counters because the people we deal with, what they count as beans. This is David Kilpatrick. He's the executive director of La Crosse Community Theater in La Crosse, Wisconsin. This is where we are. But wouldn't it be nice if instead we could get here? <laughs> so that we were still talking about numbers, but we were talking about the unmeasurable parts of the art that we make in a way that was maybe measurable. So 
At that same conference where Terrence heard Alan speak, my boss, Brad Erickson, also heard Alan speak. But at the time, Brad was what's called session hopping. So he was in the hall. <laughs> and, and he heard Alan say this sentence, if you can describe something, you can measure. This is, this is something, it turns out, that Alan was told by the evaluation director at the Wallace Foundation. And this is the, this is the crux, this is the beginning of impact assessment. It's the sentence that started it all. And it, from that sentence emerges this, this idea of intrinsic impact, which is measuring the things that we thought we couldn't measure. The intellectual, social, emotional, and empathetic impact of a piece of art on an individual using a standard metric and a common vocabulary so that everyone's speaking the same language. When my boss heard this, this was a big, exciting moment for him, and he raced back, and we got very excited about it together, and so we went out and talked to a bunch of funders. The Doris Duke Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, the San Francisco Arts Commission, City of San Jose, Theater Development Fund. We also created partnerships with some of our other regional art service organizations across the country including LA Stage Alliance here, the Theater Alliance of Greater Philadelphia, Art New York, Theater Washington, Arts Midwest. We've also now got alliances with the League of Chicago Theaters and Arts Boston, and there are more to come. We had over 100 theaters that wanted to do this work, and we only had funding for 18. But these 18 theaters represent what we thought was the diversity of theater in America. So, a community theater in a 35,000 person town in rural Wisconsin to Roundabout Theater, one of the largest arts nonprofits in the world. We then also spoke to eight other artistic directors at theaters that weren't participating in this work, as well as 12 of the artistic directors of the theaters that were, and compiled those interviews into a portion of the book. And they're all around this question of what the audience's role is in artistic creation. When do you start thinking about audiences? When do you stop? Why? And they're incredibly enlightening, and they enlighten this work tremendously. So at the end of it, 11 months of research, two and a half years of planning, 26 theaters, 12 cities, 24 interviews, four original essays, 58 productions, 60,000 surveys go out, 19,000 surveys come back, greater than 40% response rate, which is about double what we were expecting, which is very interesting when you control the budget for postage costs. You suddenly have twice as many. And all of this is available in this book, which um, I've got to say that as a director of communications, I never expected to be a research director, and I never, certainly never expected to be a project manager on a two-year research project around something as esoteric as the impact of art on an individual. And it has blown my mind wide open to the possibilities of art and to our possibility of communicating that value to other people. And so I hope, if nothing else, at the end of our sessions today, you have at least a little bit of that mind-blowing feeling going through you, and you can go out and talk about different ways of talking about what to do. With that, I give it over to Alan Brown to talk about his research. Thank you. Thank you, Clay, and good morning, everyone. Great to be in the Kirk Douglas Theater. Um, <clears throat> I have just a short amount of time to summarize an enormous amount of research. Uh, and before, before I start, um, I'll just say the, the primary objective of this study was to help the 18 theaters understand the impacts of their productions. Uh, the primary outcome of the study was not the aggregate analysis, which is what I'm here to report on. Uh, but we did roll up the data. It's an enormous, enormous data set, uh, which as a researcher, um, it makes me very, very happy because I never get 19,000 cases of anything to look at. Um, and what that means is that every analysis is statistically significant because the sample size is so big. That, that, so there's almost no error margins. And what we have to look at, so we can look at the relationship between variables and really understand some of the relationships between all of the questions we've asked at a high level of reliability. Uh, so, 
Um, <clears throat> just just to explain a little bit about the response rate. Um, thanks to the to the theaters, and especially thanks to the theater of the Court, South Coast Prep, and Musical Theater West. Our, the, front, the house staff actually counted the surveys that were left behind in the venue each night that surveying took place. So we know how many surveys were taken home. And we call that the pickup rate. And our response rate uses the pickup rate as the divisor. Uh, so that's how we get to 45%. Uh, we, we don't divide by the number of surveys we printed. We, we divide by the number of surveys that actually went home. Uh, and whenever possible, we, we used those surveys and distributed them at another performance um, so to increase the response. So uh, I'll just say that 45 response rates is huge. Uh, and, and that alone uh, says something to me about the willingness and the appetite of audiences to actually provide uh, theaters with their opinions on the artistic work uh, so all these surveys came back in the mail to my house in San Francisco, <laughs> uh, which created an interesting scenario. Um, so really the response rate, people fill out surveys because they want to help you. Uh, there were no incentives involved here. Uh, people just got an envelope, an envelope was taped to the seat using non-stick blue painter's tape. <laughs> which leaves no residue in the seats. Uh, and the outside of the envelope said, please take this home. So there's no collecting surveys at the venue, which simplified things enormously. Uh, and fill it out within 24 hours and mail it back. So that was the basic proposition. Um, the, in terms of questionnaire design, we provided a template uh, that had all these categories of questions. Uh, and there were some mandatory questions because we wanted to generate uh, similar data across all 18 theaters and all 58 productions. But there, were, there was also some room to customize the survey and the theaters work, working from the list of questions could tailor their survey. And they all did. And so they all used somewhat different indicators that kind of reflected their own interests. Um, <clears throat> Uh, before ever getting into any research, you always need to pause and think about the limitations. And there are biases in all survey data that really need to be disclosed up front. Um, and so uh, there are a couple of really important things here. Um, there's loyalty bias in the data. Subscribers always respond to twice the rate of single ticket buyers. You know, we know that uh, we did not weight the data because we didn't have anything to weight to. It would have been very, very complicated. So we're just looking at raw data, but we have a lot of data from single ticket buyers and subscribers, so they're very stable uh, uh, subsets. This impact assessment is not a contest to get the highest score. Okay, this is the most important thing. It, and, and, and impact data is fundamentally non-comparable across sites. So it really doesn't make sense to compare a production of, say, Cats uh, at a musical theater venue in uh, uh, one city with a production of an experimental drama in another city. Different audience, different art, different venue. And we have to be very, very careful not to turn this into a contest for highest scores, because a given work of art is not intended to have every impact. You know, and we have to really look at this data in a very contextual way in terms of the work of art and its inherent uh, attributes. All right, so that's really the biggest uh, qualification uh, that I want to just remind you as we go through here, you know, but nevertheless, we do in the report look at results across sites, you know, because it's interesting and it just raises interesting questions. Okay, uh, this is my first sort of throwaway graph just for your entertainment. Uh, who subscribes by age cohort? 
the purple bars are single ticket buyers, the green bars are subscribers. And um, uh, this is a whole other session <laughs> that we don't need to have today. But it, it does tell a recurring story that I know many of you are living, uh, which is the, the generational uh, appeal of subscription packaging and advanced planning. And it came through very, very loud and clear uh, in our data, and we'll spend a little bit of time thinking about single ticket buyers. Motivations for attending was one of the first questions. Uh, uh, every theater, uh, almost every theater asked this question. Uh, we gave people a pre a pre coded list of 11 motivations and asked them to pick three. And this graph displays seven motivations that were sort of most interesting, and it displays them by age cohort. So the blue line at the top, you know, is to relax or escape. And I just love this. It's like, let's never lose sight of the fact that people go out just to relax and kind of get away from it all. And that motivation goes up significantly up with age and then tapers off. And there's an interesting sort of pivot point at the, oh gosh, the age cohorts, are, I don't know if you can see here, along the bottom, are 15 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45, 55, 65, 75 plus, all right, they're obscured by the screen a little bit. Oh, the red line here, the second, is to be emotionally moved or inspired, which goes up again with age, which is so interesting, sort of seeking emotional outcomes and then uh, plateaus. Here's interesting, the green line, to spend quality time with family members. <laughs> this, thank heavens, goes up into the child-rearing years. Okay? And then plunges. <laughs> where uh, spending time with family matters, it, it, as a motivation, you know, uh, is less prominent. Uh, the purple line to revisit a familiar work of art. This is so interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that now there were about 12 to 15 musicals among the 58 productions. The rest were drama. Um, and on average, this you know revisiting a familiar work of art goes up with age, uh, which I guess is intuitive to some extent. As you and I can certainly speak for myself, I tend to listen over and over again to my favorite classical music pieces, and I take great comfort in that. And a lot of people come back to art that they know and love, and it's a huge part of the value system around art. In the theater, we tend to put a premium on aesthetic growth, you know, stretching people, exposing them to something new. But aesthetic validation is what I call, you know, going back to the same art over and over again, is also a legitimate part of the value system. <laughs> And it, but it's not easy to embrace, always. But, you know, Nutcracker, Christmas Carol, ritualized gathering is a huge part of the art system. So just a couple other interesting, the black line here are people who said, because someone else invited you. Well, of course <laughs> other people, yeah. you know, come. And that just, again, speaks to the social dimension, the social importance of attendance amongst younger adults who often uh, are uh, not in a relationship and therefore need to look outside of their own home for a uh, catalyst. Uh, and it's just a fundamentally different situation when you don't have someone in your home to go with. Because it means you have to construct a social outing in order to get outside. This is, you know, one of the findings of arts research for the last 15 years, really, is that and an invitation from a friend is, is, explains like half of all arts participation. <laughs> and that most, a majority of the audience members on any given night did not buy a ticket. Yeah. And among those people, many did not even participate in a decision process, they just got asked. Right, so, so um, social dimension. And then the yellow line are the percentage set for work or educational purposes. And of course it's higher for the youngest adults, many of whom are in school still. Uh, and we generally find, I found this in a, a big study of the Steppenwolf Theater, that 
the young, the young adults in the audience are more likely to themselves be actors, writers, directors, and have some personal connection, and hungry for engagement. Yes? Were these motivations exclusively? Were they only that just one motivation? Three. You got three. Okay, um, here's a little fun graph. We asked the theaters to report the percent capacity sold for each performance, and I was able to plot that against the anticipation levels in the audience. So how much are you looking forward to this? Now bear in mind, we're, we're surveying people after the show and we're asking them retrospectively, how much were you looking forward to this? So their answer might be colored by their actual experience, but it's the best we could do because unlike the original uh, value study, um, we were unable to survey people both in advance and afterwards, right? We're, for this study, just surveying people afterwards, but sure enough, there's a statistically significant relationship between anticipation and percent capacity sold. What does that tell you? Can you explain what you mean by percent capacity? Sure. Sorry, um, sorry uh, 80, the eighty percent of the seats are sold on a given night. Seventy-five percent, ninety percent. It's the percent of the house that's filled. So you ask people... To... So, so sorry, the question was, how much were you looking forward to this performance? And, and then... A lot of people that said we were looking forward to it. For the that's right. So people in full houses reported higher anticipation levels. So people come to see plays that they can feel enjoy. That's the relationship. Well... Um, I think it says something about using appropriately sized venues where they can be full, because when the venue is full, people's anticipation levels go up. And that's important because anticipation is actually an indicator of impact. That's why you have to be restaurant. Exactly. It's exactly, that's a perfect analogy. It's like going into an empty restaurant. Right? Yes. On your anticipation levels, that were those was five like the most anticipated I can imagine, yes. or was someone anticipated and three was a little bit. The scale was one to five, and, and you're looking at a plot of average anticipation level by percent capacity sold. And you just asked them to fill in a star rating, basically, of their anticipation. anticipation. Yeah, they had one to five. All right, so, so there's a psychology of being in a full venue, that, that's all. We can't necessarily conclude that there are other cofactors that might account for some of this, like if there's a star performer um, that might also explain this, but it does say, you know, I know you're all going to go home and say we have to paper our house every performance to make it full, but there's a grain of truth, there's a grain of truth in, in uh, full houses boosting anticipation rates. So uh, uh, a fair amount of our questioning had to do with pre and post performance engagement. Um, and the theaters really asked, asked us to kind of expand our question set around here. Um, so initially here, um, there we go, uh, preparation. We asked people, did you do anything to prepare? By your own definition, did you do anything to prepare? The red line here is the average, again, we're looking at this across age cohorts, from 15 to 24 to 65 plus. Uh, on average, about 25% of audiences said they did anything to prepare. How does that hit you? Is that good, bad, expected? Do you think it's good? Uh -huh. I'm looking forward to it because of my schedule. Uh-huh, yes. What do you mean by prepare? Well, what do you mean by prepare? <laughs> I have no idea. I needed to decide whether they were going to warm enough coat or did they read it? Uh-huh, sure. So I have a sore day later, so I had to read it. Sure. Sure. <laughs> she said, did, does, what does preparation mean? Does it mean you're, you know, dressed appropriately or... Did you read the play? Well, many of these theaters asked the follow-up open-ended question, what did you do to prepare? 
and the answers are fascinating. Uh, as you can see from this graph, because we're also, we also plot here the percentage of people said they read a review or a preview, is you can deduce from this graph that some people who read a review or preview reported that as preparation, and others did not. So you can drive a truck through the definition of preparation, basically. But if you look at the open ends, it's fascinating. Wikipedia. Uh, I was surprised by how many people cited Wikipedia as a source of preparation. And, and I guess if you think about it, it makes sense. It's a, it's a resource that people rely on for a lot of things. But look at the generational shift of who's reading reviews. That's the green line. It's like Valley of the Dolls. She did the green Generational shift. Huge generational shift in who's reading reviews. And inversely, there's a, a generational shift in who's reading comments on the show written by friends or family member. You know, uh, I would say, fa you know, uh, Facebook, mostly. You know. So this tells a whole other story, which I'm sure many of you are living, uh, about the, the shift in uh, who, who people believe or turn to for, tr for trusted information. You know, and I'm glad you're having a session on criticism, Terrence, because, you know, it's a huge part of the of the ecology here and other, our other research uh, really shows there's a segment of theater goers who won't go unless they read something telling them that they can't miss that. You know? Uh, okay. Uh, Post-performance engagement um, <clears throat> by age cohort. Again, similar age cohorts along the bottom of the graph here. Um, and you know, just notice a downward trend by age in general, um, which is very interesting. O older folks are less likely to report emailing or speaking to friends, reflecting privately, searching for info online. But what goes up with age? Right. Reading the program book. <laughs> so this is really yes. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, did you guys ask? I'm trying to see if there's anything about like um, materials that theaters put on the website itself. So like program type articles that are on our website. Yeah, we didn't ask specifically. Um, we yeah. just asked generally about search for information online, and that's the green line. <coughs> yeah. And it's you know predictably age related. Yeah. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, significantly lower. The black line here, the percentage who went to a post-performance discussion, all right, which is merely a reflection of the availability of those programs, the limited availability of those programs. Okay. But at the top, the red line is email or speak to a friend. You know, and of course, you know, this was a finding of of, of, of our other studies. Uh, that you know the dominant mode of make, me, making meaning after a live performance is talking about it on the way home. Of course it is. But we spend a lot of energy producing post-performance discussions and you know in venue stuff. And I don't think as a field we've really applied ourselves to eliciting conversation outside of our venues. Yeah. And how could that happen? How could we do that? And take the cue here from the program book. I mean, I don't know how many of you, uh, but I always thought of program books as preparatory instruments, right? And you think about how many people actually have time to sit down and madly flip through their program and try to see if they can read the first paragraph of the synopsis before the lights go down. Yes? I'm just wondering about the program book also being a function of age. Um, uh -huh. I, uh, it, it's damn hard to read them in theaters. That's true. Unless, that, that'll bother. That's right. 
So keep the house lights on so people can read their programs. There's also a, a font size issue for people with you know, uh, trouble seeing. Yeah, but so this is really changing our thinking uh, about program books as a post-performance meaning-making uh, device. And I just encourage you to think about what content you might put in program books that would help people talk about their experiences with each other. Um, okay, uh, one of our favorite questions here, my favorite question of the whole survey was, did you leave with questions you would have liked to have asked the actors, director, or playwright? 35% on average said, I left with unanswered questions. Now, is it good or bad that people are leaving with questions? Good. Yeah. That ranged from great to bad. <laughs> I think it's great if you have a forum for them to express that question and uh -huh. have somebody on staff that can answer those questions. But if you're, I, would, I mean, I don't want to make the assumption, but if somebody has unanswered questions, yeah. I think of our patrons, they didn't get it, so they didn't like it. So I would think maybe that's not Unanswered questions, it's like being constipated. <laughs> 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 so, uh, uh, the whole point is that if you can't, you don't have a, a forum for asking your questions, that it's a missed opportunity, right? Yes? And I also think that's part of the way that we're training our audiences. I mean, I, I feel like I saw that, I worked at Temple where we had push out every play, and I felt like I could see the audience shift from I didn't get that right in the moment, so I didn't like it, to I didn't get that, oh my god, there's all of this ambiguity to mine, I'm a part of this production, let's talk about it. Uh-huh. You know? It's Great. Technology. Sorry, other hands? Yes? How does this range across ages, actually? Sure. Um, I don't think I have the age graph here, but I do have a few, a few cross tabs to share with you. We coded all these shows by type, so we have experimental, one-person shows, challenging material, star-driven, and so forth. And, and the percentage with unanswered questions went from a high of 51% for experimental work, which makes perfect sense, to a low of 21% for contemporary musicals. Which... <laughs> Now, let's not make value judgments about <laughs> <laughs> musicals. The, the high here was from uh, 70, 69% for Camino Real at Theatre Boston Court, which we're going to this about, to a low of 10% for production of It's a Wonderful Life, the radio play. <laughs> you know, that's, so here's a little more on that. So, Here's It's a Wonderful Life, right? Right, and I've seen it even lower than that from now on. A high of seventy percent falls for Camino Rail. But there's a couple of interesting things in here. There were two pairs of productions in our uh, samples. There were two productions of uh, Let Me Down Easy, Anna Deere Smith's one woman show, uh, in different cities. Same show different sites, and remarkably similar levels of unanswered questions, about 40 to 45 percent. There were also two productions of Ruined, the play Ruined. One was at Arena Stage, one was at Berkeley Rep. And I'm not going to tell you which site was which. <laughs> and, but one generated a lot more unanswered questions. They were actually different productions of the same work. And it's just very provocative if you start to ask why would the audience at one site report, you know, such higher uh, levels of unanswered questions. There's a lot of potential explanations, right? But we think of unanswered questions as an indicator of intellectual stimulation. Um, and we looked at this data generated a mountain of qualitative data in the form of questions, because we asked everyone, what were some of your questions? And 98% of everyone who said they had questions told us what their questions were. And they were 
phrased as questions. And I have to say, uh, just in terms of quality of data, this is so rich. Because people, by reading their questions, tells you a huge amount about their understanding of the play, what's important to them, what insights they're seeking. And the questions are all over the map, from, you know, how do you do this every night? You know, questions about the actors, uh, um, questions about the production elements, sets, costumes, but mostly questions about kind of why did you do this play? Or even why is this play entitled what it is? Uh, and this search for what I call curatorial insight. Right, just the why, what's special, what's interesting about this work. And you can transmit curatorial insight in many ways. Sometimes in your program books you have a note from the director. Uh, on your websites you might have a video interview. Or you might actually do a curtain speech. Like, uh, you know, or at the, like at the top of an orchestra concert when the conductor speaks. And it gives the audience a little insight into the program. You know, heaven forbid people would go home having some idea why these three pieces wound up on the same program. You know, audiences are hungry for curatorial insight, and that comes through loud and clear when we look at their questions. So I'll give you a sense of, of impact results here. We use radar charts to summarize an enormous amount of data. Uh, and these are the three productions that we surveyed at Woolly Mammoth Theater in Washington. Uh, and they presented The Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, the one man show that's been in the news lately, in a big way. Uh, and that's the green, uh, the green area on the chart. The blue area is a production of Booty Candy, um, which Clay will give you a little background on. So, so Booty Candy, um, does anyone know what Booty Candy is? I mean, it's like, good, okay. So, um, Booty Candy is one of the only shows in the 58 Productions that was termed a dramedy. Um, and it also, uh, they, Willie has a unique process where they actually ask the playwright who he wants in the audience. Um, and so in this case, this is a play about gay African American culture. They figured he might say, I love some gay African American people in the audience. And instead, he, he asked them to pursue African American churchgoers in Washington, D.C. Um, and so you'll see in some of the results, um, kind of a schizophrenic response, which is really interesting to be able to see in the data, and which they considered a great success. Thanks. Um, Oedipus El Rey was the third production. So I'll, I'll just go around the wheel quickly in case you yeah. can't read these. At the top is captivation. How absorbed were you? This is our lead indicator of impact, it is captivation, the extent that you get fully absorbed in the art. Uh, captivation or flow. You may have heard the term flow. Uh, there was a wonderful book in 1990 by a brilliant, brilliant uh, psychologist uh, who lives actually in the LA area, Miali, Chicksen Miali, Chicksen Miali, excuse me, called Flow, the Theory of the Optimal Experience. I've had it by my bedside for three years, and every time I crack it open, I fall sound asleep. <laughs> <laughs> someday I'll make it through. Exactly. But it's basically that being fully absorbed in whatever you're doing is the root of happiness. That's, that's what he asserts, whether you're cutting the grass, or doing the dishes, or sitting in a the theater. Is, is, and I actually believe that's one of the main reasons people go out, is to achieve a state of consciousness called flow, where, because there, there is value in achieving that state of consciousness apart from everything else. Um, so we asked our lead indicator of how absorbed were you. And the agony I see Steve Jobs came out a little higher than the other two productions. Uh, another indicator of captivation chosen by this theater was uh, how gripping was the production. Uh, Similar, similar to how absorbed, very, very similar. In the future, we probably won't 
uh, allow that question because it's just redundant. Um, emotional. What was it? How uh, strong was your emotional response from weak to strong? All right, just magnitude of emotion. Uh, to what extent you feel empathy uh, uh, or a connection with one or more of the characters in the play? Much higher for Steve Jobs. Uh, in, here's an indicator for you. To what extent did you leave the theater resolved to make a change in your life? <laughs> wow. <laughs> this theater elected that indicator because they see themselves as a change agent. And look at the results for this one that show. Uh, I mean, this show was designed to elicit that reaction. And this theater, they had pamphlets in the lobby about people getting involved in labor issues in China. They had an apple orchard where you could wander through and see all the different products that people were being abused to create. Wow. Yeah, and this, it was pretty heavy. Um, we had a question on Twitter uh, wondering, are there differences in responses to these questions based on ethnicity? Um, that's a great question. Um, most of the theaters elected not to ask the race question. A few theaters did, but there are so few respondents of color that we can't do the analysis. Wow. Which is a big issue. Well, and Ellen, can you talk about, so yeah. just so, I mean, yes, we have way too many white people in our houses, but that does not, that, that particular result does not speak directly to that. Can you talk about the survey bias for race? A little well, um, uh, achieving accurate uh, ethnicity results in surveying is extraordinarily diff difficult. Um, uh, for a wide range of reasons, uh, it's it's notoriously difficult uh, um, and, and a well-known phenomenon in the research world to, to get Hispanics to complete surveys because there may be language issues. Um, we did not offer the survey in Spanish uh, because in past survey efforts, we just never they had just a few responses in Spanish. Uh, other, some people we know don't feel they can fill out a survey because uh, they're confused about confidentiality issues and we do ask some demographics and people steer away from that. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge to get, and this is especially true in the museum field also, is getting accurate, because I hear it all the time, People who go to their own exhibits and productions and say, we had a diverse audience, but our survey results look white. You know, and it's, it's a chronic problem that we have in the research. And, and Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis, um, their whole mission is around speaking to um, communities that don't normally come to the arts, um, including uh, the disabled community. But, but in, in they do a bunch of surveying in order to prove that they are kind of doing that. And their surveying is very aggressive. It, it, and I, I mean, that's an odd word to use, but they literally hand the people a paper and a pencil and loom over them until they have completed the survey and then take it away. And they, and they explain to people why they have to do that and why it's important that they get an accurate representation of the audience. So their, one of their issues with this work, which they, they participated in, is that they didn't feel they were actually getting an accurate representation of the impact on the whole audience because we didn't want them to loom over all of their people. For this stuff, right? Yeah. Right. There was a question here. Though. No, I, I just, I just to state, uh, it's interesting that you would say this. You know, doing a, a survey in Spanish because, honestly, uh, theaters in in the United States we, we cater to the middle class, and and there are a slew of Latino audiences that are middle class that don't need the survey to be in Spanish. Uh, and so that's a, that's a very interesting uh, indication yeah. that we really don't know uh, the, the middle class Latino audience who would in fact come to our theaters uh, if there was work that related to them. Just to say that. Thank you. Um, just continuing um, around the wheel here. Uh, uh, oh. uh, one thing you didn't cover is income. Correct. Do anything with that? Um, we um, 
the primary purpose of this survey was to focus on the impact, not to gain an accurate demographic picture of the audience. So that's why we really, uh, age, age and gender are the only consistent variables. Um, Sure, sure. We also did not ask about educational attainment or presence of children in the family, uh, just because that wasn't the focus of this survey. Well, and it's something that we are interested in. In terms of income, one thing that we are interested in that, that um, we, we've got to look and see if we have enough data to, to do is, um, is ticket price. But particularly, in the, the problem is we don't have enough data to do what would be the right question, which is how much did paying for this ticket impact on financial aid? Because that's actually more important than the ultimate price of the ticket, and we believe that there's probably a relationship with, with how much of a sacrifice financially you made to be there, and how much um, of an impact that this has on you. Question. Um, I just want to say something for this audience that I think is important. I just. I hear what you're saying about statistics, but I don't think the idea that we don't have diverse audiences in our theater is going to be a real shocker for anyone. And um, I think, I just want to articulate the fact that this is a 911, this is a wake up call to us, that that is demographic suicide, and that we have to get real about this in the American theater community. And I just wanted to take that moment to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, intellectual insight, our lead indicator here was did you gain new learning or insight? Much higher for Magni and XCC jobs. Moving around, did you think, here's an interesting indicator, did you think about the structure of the play? Which is sort of a educational outcome in a way, and it was actually highest for booty candy because Clay, I put down my microphone. It was episodic, and it also broke the fourth wall at, at points. Um, and Woolley's actually particularly interested in this question because their plays often mess with structure um, in a way that, that disorients their audience. They, they have a saying that they like to be one step ahead of their audience, but not two. And um, in, in a lot of cases, um, they, they didn't actually serve it, but they had a, another show uh, called House of Gold that was basically about John Benet Ramsey. Um, and was just very messed up in terms of structure, and the structure lost the audience on that show, they believe. So that's why they asked this type of question. Um, I'm going to move quickly. Exposed to something new. Here's our indicator of aesthetic growth. Much higher for Booty Canyon, Oedipus El Rey, um, as, a, you know, a, 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 as a counterpoint to the Steve Jobs play, um, which did not expose people to something new. They were familiar with that. Social, the sense of connectedness, these are two indicators of social bridging and bonding, and I'll just make a clarification. Our indicators are uh, sort of two types of social outcomes. Social bonding is feeling closer to my community, however you define that, racially, ethnically, sexual orientation, any kind of community that you identify with. Social bonding is feeling closer to that community in some way. Social bridging is uh, gaining new appreciation for people who are different than you. Uh, social bridging, social bonding come from Robert Putnam's work from his book Bowling Alone. Very useful. Essential impacts of arts experiences, they can occur simultaneously and often do, but they're just two sides of a coin. This theater elected to ask a question about social bonding, about feeling closer to uh, the people you identify with, and uh, for the Agony I see of Steve Jobs, that was a much higher indicator, and then for Booty Candy. All right, so this just gives you a flavor for, for impact, the impact footprint, three different productions at one theater. Um, roundabout Theater in New York, you were there three productions. Anything Goes, big musical production. Was the green, the importance of being earnest is the blue area. And the milk train doesn't stop here anymore is the um, sort of maroon area here. Um, and, you know, it's just a way to start a conversation in this theater. You can imagine getting these results for your production. So, you know, you, know, you kind of want to start to think through, well, why? 
you know, why did anything go was generate higher captivation levels, higher uh, feelings of empathy, but um, why did the importance of being earnest generate um, higher um, levels of aesthetic growth uh, and high levels of intellectual stimulation? Well, it turned out um, that in, in the importance of being earnest, Brian Benford was cast as Lady Bracknell. And in the list of unanswered questions, that came out in spades. It was question after question. What was it like playing a woman? You know, what preparation did you do? You know, are you looking for other female roles to play? <laughs> Favorite question. And so it, it's just, you know, to see when, when a non-traditional casting decision is made, it has an impact. And it, it, it raises questions, and it has a measurable impact on the audience. Uh, we looked at all plays and all musicals. Now, I can't say that this is a definitive uh, data on all musicals and all plays. Our sample was not designed to be representative of all plays and all musicals, but it's a pretty good cross-section. And you can see that by and large, musicals had higher captivation scores, uh, the audiences of musicals, uh, higher empathy, and of course people are singing and dancing and acting, right? Um, but look at the higher intellectual uh, stimulation levels for plays, which on some level is intuitive, right? Uh, higher social outcomes for the musical theater, higher aesthetic validation for musicals, of course. People go back to musicals they love, some people do, right? So this just gives you a sense, that, and in the report, you can see we compare differences for different categories of productions. <clears throat> Decision makers, surprise, surprise, report categorically higher impacts than non-decision makers. Of course they do. They got it together, they look for information, <laughs> they're more informed about what they're going to experience, and therefore report higher anticipation levels and higher impacts than the people. This is why if you really want to get a full picture of your audience, you have to go into the venue with paper surveys in order to survey people who did not buy tickets. Right, there's a big trade-off to surveying ticket buyers, which is you get a, a, a more loyal, more tuned in, a higher impact audience. And what's really provocative, probably the, the, the biggest headline of the whole analysis, is that uh, single ticket buyers reported categorically higher impacts than subscribers. Um, why do you suppose that is so? Because they're choosing, that's right. They're that last line decision maker more than our decision makers, right? Okay, what's what's behind that? They don't go as often. So it's more it's more of an event experience than subscribers who go a lot, see a lot more cynical, kind of like show me something. Uh -huh. Subscribers get fussy. <laughs> well, frequency, um, I think lead you know, this is so interesting about the arc of one's involvement over a lifetime in an art form and how frequency you learn more and you get more discerning, I think, with exposure. And what you're saying is that when you're infrequent, it's more special in, in a way, which is the same truth with sex and drugs. <laughs> Half joking, but there's a there's a grain of truth to that, which is that pleasure. I mean, there's a in the literature around cognitive psychology, pleasure changes the brain chemistry, and one seeks higher thresholds of pleasure when one is frequently exposed to it, and so I think that's true with art. That you know, when you've experienced peak moments in your life. You know what that's like, and you know when you're not getting it. <laughs> you know, in a way. Why else would single ticket buyers? Yes? Well, it's, a, it's a different form of behavior. So um, it's 
that it's, uh, I think, very self-fulfilling because the feeling of kind of discovery. Um, and then it's that kind of, it's the best kind of testimonial because if they're bringing that guest, they suddenly become you know, right. word of mouth. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. They're very powerful consumers. Mm -hmm. So there's a fulfillment going on uh -huh. around single ticket time. Yes? Also discovering the venue <coughs> or the company versus the product itself and that particular experience. They found a new mm -hmm. Well, the, So here's a question for you. So they found a new home, you say. So why don't they come back? <laughs> no. I didn't say they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Sometimes when you see a play, not good and it's expensive, so therefore you want to be more selective about what you see. Uh -huh. Aren't you get fun? Uh -huh. Unfortunately, we don't have the data, but I would love to look at ticket price in relation to the impact, and particularly in the context of ability to pay. You know, and if people who spend a lot by their own standards report higher impacts or not. It would be fascinating, wouldn't it? So, I just encourage you to think here. If infrequent attenders are having more impactful experiences, why aren't they coming back more often? I also think we do a lot to reach out to subscribers that we hold uh -huh. up in an ongoing conversation and make them feel like this is a home for them. And I think we don't always spend that same level of care on our single ticket buyers. You know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Yes? Also, in Los Angeles, it's a tremendous choice. So the thing is, right. you know, I don't think we go back to the same one because we go back to more than another. Right. <laughs> well, I think there's more and more people like you <laughs> who are kind of a super strain of single ticket buyers. <laughs> Jim is nodding his head. Uh, who uh, are very sophisticated shoppers and who are just choosing exactly what they want to see. And I, I guess this is one of the truths of, uh, of segmentation research that we've done is there tends to be a segment of people who are loyal to the company and another segment of people who are loyal to the art form. And speaking to them, you know, is very different. Yes? How do you notice buyers are infrequent attenders. I mean, mm -hmm. lots of people who buy subscriptions don't go to every show that they subscribe to. Right. They, they have a social defined. Right. The question is, how do we know that single ticket buyers are infrequent? All we know from this data is that they're infrequent at that theater. Oh, right. But they may, in fact, be voracious consumers of theater across the system. Well, and separately, we looked at frequency of attendance at that theater. So there are there are absolutely single ticket buyers in that sample who have gone to five shows at your theater and are not subscribers. Equally, there are subscribers at that theater who have gone to one show that year. We separated those two questions okay. um, because there's not really a way to ask them at the same time. But both both sets of data exist in the data. I think this also raises some interesting questions about subscribers. Um, and the need to engage them. Uh, because if you think about it, subscribers buy a basket of risk. <laughs> they, they don't often necessarily choose some of the productions. And I think they often forget what they bought. And it kind of comes out of the radar map. Honey, I'll be going tomorrow night. Yeah, what's on? I forgot. And they often don't tune in until maybe the hours before. And um, you know, we know that when people are uh, anticipating a production more, they're more likely to report higher impact. So, really suggest that maybe we could do more with subscribers to kind of heighten their anticipation and get them, you know, um, kind of juiced up. So. Um, uh, I'd like to, sorry, do you have a question? This is a comment about anticipation. I think you mentioned it earlier about the full house. I was thinking that people can be anticipated as soon as they see publicity. You know, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'll speak to that at the very end, uh, but you're right on target. Uh, okay, so just quickly, we had some fun with word clouds. 
uh, we asked uh, this question, uh, whoops, of almost everyone, uh, what emotions were you feeling as you left? Um, and um, for your entertainment, I have a word policy. Uh, this is a production of Ruined and Arena Stage. Now, when, when you do word clubs, you have to clean up a lot of the extraneous, like the words, uh, articles, and so forth. Look at the juxtaposition of hopeful and sad. Disgust, despair, shock, frustration, horrified, depressed, helpless, anguish, pain. And the, you know, this is a really serious drama, and the anguish comes through in this data. All right, completely different production. Very different uh, uh, radar of uh, emotions. And here's your booty candy. <laughs> now, remember what Clay said about this production, and particularly who the playwright hoped would come? And this is an example of, of how impact results have to be contextualized. Confused, disappointed, could be taken several ways. If the playwright's objective was to get conservative folks in the theater and expose them to some progressive ideas, confused and disappointed is mission fulfillment. So it's just an example of how, you know, if you're submitting this word cloud with your grant report, you really want to add some narrative to it and explain, uh, you know, what's here. But this is easy, you know, word clouds. And we're, we're just uh, uh, working now to develop a system uh, where people would walk out of the theater and text the words they're feeling to a text number and, and word cloud projected on the wall in the lobby would automatically update and the audience will build a shared word cloud immediately after the production in the lobby. It'd be fun, wouldn't that be fun? And it just is an engagement, uh, a way of uh, starting a conversation. Um, you know, is what I'm feeling the same thing that other people are feeling? Um, but that creates all sorts of software issues around filtering out profanity, you know, if you want to, or allowing. Yes? The best way for engagement is our talk back. Talk back. So it's interesting you say that. The talk back rate is actually pretty low and um, fairly specific to a certain group of people. One of the things that we found is that um, there's a lot of different ways that, that people like to engage and that the dominant way actually happens outside of the theater. Um, one of the things that we're suggesting is a really easy way to kind of do some impact uh, magnification is to send a list of questions home with your audience members so that they can have that same talkback style conversation after they leave. Because for a certain group of people, you're absolutely right, talkbacks are incredibly crucial to their assessment and kind of making of the meaning of the show. And for other people, um, the idea of sitting in a, a hall and listening to someone talk at them is absolutely anathema, and they would prefer to just go home and sit around their table with them. Um, yeah? I also want to say that a lot of talkbacks in our field in general, I've sat through a lot of them, and they make me hurt and viewers. I hate them so much. So I think we also have to, like, um, distinguish between, we need to like have more art around how we lead talkbacks. Uh -huh. Like I think it's not enough just to throw someone up there and have them answer so, the questions. Terrence, there's a subject for another session. Yeah. It's great. All right, I need to move on because we have to break. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, I want to share with you kind of, this is as far as I've been able to take impact assessment because we have this huge data set for, uh, able to look at relationships between variables and compute correlations and, and R-squared, which is a statistic that speaks to effect size, right? When in a very large sample, when everything is statistically significant in terms of var variability, you really want to look at effect size. How much explanatory power does one variable have over another? Because you can have very small differences that are statistically significant, and researchers can really spin that in an unhelpful way. So start here. 
familiarity, preparation, and feeling welcome, right? That's where it all starts. That's kind of the, the floor. And our data suggests that when you have these things in some combination, especially familiarity with the story, that was, it. That was, that was the highest predictor of anticipation, is when you know the story. Twice as high as familiarity with the cast, and familiarity with the playwright. So, you know, just emphasizes we gotta we gotta explain the story. We get more people familiar with the story because they're more likely to anticipate. Anticipation is the is is the the stem of the impact system. How much are you looking forward to this? Well, if you look at at the relationship between anticipation and captivation, it's a correlation of 0 0.34. A perfect correlation is one, perfect positive correlation. An effect size of 0.16% of the variance in captivation is explained by anticipation. All right, it's a key relationship. People who have a higher level of anticipation are more likely to be captivated. Okay? Um, anticipation also, if you just correlate it with impact, with summative impact, and the indicator there is, a year from now, how much of an impression will be left? That was the best indicator of summative impact. There's a 0.4 correlation between anticipation and summative impact. All right, so what can you do, you know, everyone in your organization, to increase the likelihood that your audience members will be captivated or will be anticipating? This is why marketing is so strategic, is because often the marketing message is the only context that people have going into a production. All they've ever seen, all they've ever read, is the two sentences in your brochure in, the, in that image. Right, so this speaks to the comment we had earlier. Marketing is contextualization. This diagram is in the book, and it's in the downloadable uh, PDF file that you can get at intrinsicimpact.org. So, moving on. Look at the relationship between captivation and summative impact. Correlation of 0.7, right? Captivation actually is part of impact, so there's uh, there's some redundancy here, right? But it just means that if you're not captivated, you can't. All the other impacts, emotional, intellectual, social, aesthetic, can't happen if you're sleeping, <laughs> right? But if you're fully present in the work, it opens the door to all those other impacts. Post-performance engagement has a 0.39 correlation with summative impact, so meaning making, whether it's a talk back or it's other efforts that you make, you know, that are more scalable, that, that allow audience members to engage each other. And that's a big win. It has a positive effect on impact. That's why engagement is so critical, because it magnifies impact. And then summative impact, thank heavens, has an impact on loyalty, has an effect on loyalty. Loyalty is measured by willingness to recommend your theater to a friend. So that's all very, very good. That's a 0.5 correlate, point, excuse me, 0.32. And where it all kind of breaks down is loyalty, does loyalty lead to repeat attendance? <laughs> and the answer is not, not always. We, we, don't, we, don't, we also don't have enough data. And we have all the single ticket buyers who report very impactful experiences, but only come back infrequently. So I just close again by asking you, if, if artistic excellence is not enough to get people to come back as frequently as you would like them to, what is? And on that note, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Thank you. If anyone is leaving early, please fill out your evaluation survey. Uh, I'm going to give you very briefly a, uh, uh, a little orientation to the dashboard tool that was created for this project that will be uh, more widely available. Uh, and then we'll quickly transition to our three panelists. Two, two, <laughs> two, two panelists. panelists. Uh, we will soon have uh, uh, who will illustrate the dashboard kind of through their own uh, questions. There he is. Okay. All right, so... Um,
Yeah. Um, this is the intrinsicimpact.org website. It's a website that I just wanted to create to, to get the word out about impact assessment. Uh, there's background information here uh, on what the, the underlying concepts, data collection methods. There's a button called um, references. Uh, that if you click on that button, you'll see essentially a bibliography of, of all the major studies internationally on uh, impact assessment, and at the top of that list is this study, and a link to uh, download the Wolf Brown Research Report. You've seen highlights of it, but you get the whole thing. It's also in the book, but what is not in the book are the appendices, including the protocol. The actual questions, the list of survey questions. Um, so if you want to access the protocol, and I would be thrilled if you would do that, in order to borrow some questions for your own surveys, uh, or learn more, under the references button here, you can download the Wolfram uh, PDF report. Okay, so the three, the three theaters, clicked on that red button at the top, said client login, and they got to a page that looks a little bit like this. This is Wooly Mammoth's dashboard. There are seven buttons on the, on the home page of the dashboard corresponding to the different categories of data. And if you scroll down, um, you see actually what's in your dashboard in terms of the number of survey responses. And in, in um, most of the cases, we actually surveyed staff members of the theater about what impacts they anticipated their audience would report. And we report that data right in the dashboard alongside what the audience actually reported uh, as a conversation starter. Um, so this just shows you what's in your dashboard. Uh, when you click through on any of these buttons, you get a drop down, a series of drop down menus. What, what shows do you want to display in your dashboard? Uh, and then um, what filter? Uh, these are essentially cross tabs, so you can filter by age, by gender, by ticket type, uh, by donor status, if you ask that question. Uh, and essentially it's just a way of applying cross tabs to your impact data. Um, you can also choose to display uh, your information by show or across all shows. So you can aggregate results across shows. And the whole idea here is that uh, it kind of removes the consultant from the reporting process and allows you to interrogate your own survey results from your desktop and pose questions and answer them in the environment of this dashboard. Um, so, for example, did you do anything to prepare? This is Willie Mammoth, about 30% across their three productions. Oedipus L. Ray, Agni, and SCC Jones, and Woody Kennedy said they did anything to prepare, which is pretty high, and when you apply a filter to that for ticket type, this is what you get. So now we're looking at subscribers and single ticket buyers by production, you know, and what you have is other, these are comps and group tickets. So it's a very small sample size you want to basically ignore anything that's that small. Um, so just an example of how you apply filters, what this looks like. So let's transition to our panel. Um, and we'll go first with theater at Boston Court. And um, I have just a couple of uh, slides here, and I'll ask questions of you based on your actual results. So um, first, could you give us a little background on your three productions? Sure. <laughs> uh, Tamino Real, as Tennessee wants you to pronounce it, uh, uh, was actually a co-production with CalArts, the first uh, we've ever done a co-production in a professional venue with a, with a school. Um, and uh, what other background are you are you actually? Well, just just a tiny bit about maybe the plot the story. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Camino Real is a story about a bunch of people in what what might be called purgatory, um, uh, who are terrified of terra incognita, which is the place that lives beyond the walls, 
of this walled city in which are interred um, characters of fiction as well as um, invented characters, characters like um, Don Quixote and, um, uh, uh, of course, I'm Marguerite, who's a fictive character, and Casanova, and Lord Byron, and Kilroy, who's a sort of a created character from the Kilroy was here, <coughs> um, and a bunch of other sort of lost souls um, who find themselves in, in this sort of puzzled place. Um, in the places essentially run by a, a sort of unfeeling hotel proprietor. Um, and um. Yeah, um, that's the short version. Um, and they're terrified of the place that lives beyond the walls, which is essentially terra incognita. Um, for me, the play is a story about people in stuck places who are more frightened of change than they are being in the same place. Um, How to Disappear <coughs> Completely and Never Be Found is a beautiful play by Finn Kennedy, essentially about a, a young executive in terrible trouble whose life has gone so awry following the death of his mother that he decides it would be better to disappear. He seeks a seaside fortune teller who actually gives him the means by which to do so. But one of the questions is, is he actually alive or is he dead lying on a morgue on a slab um, having a, a conversation with his pathologist? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, cheery, cheery, right? Um, and then Heavier Than is uh, the story of the Minotaur in the Labyrinth. It's a mashup of several Greek dramas, um, including Icarus comes to visit, and uh, it's essentially actually a story about um, a man who's desperate to please his parents and what happens when the difference between the, the, uh, the mythology he's gotten about his own family and the truth is revealed. Fantastic. My head is spinning. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, Captivation, overall, how much did the skill and artistry of the actors impress you? And we're looking at average Captivation uh, scores here by age cohort. Uh, and uh, what you see is uh, very high scores, I'm just going to call this Disappear, uh, really consistently across the age cohorts. There's also a little interesting pattern here, is that actually the captivation levels went up with age uh, a little bit here. And I guess my question is, um, did, uh, did, th did this make sense to you in terms of the Disappear production that people would be more captivated? Yes, it does make sense to me actually. Why? Uh, well, <laughs> in terms of accessibility, it, it, how to Disappear is somewhat more accessible than Camera Real. Um, not only that, it asked, it had a very brilliant performance in its major character, um, which was central to the whole story, and um, I think was universally um, loved. Brad Culver, who played um, the, the guy, um, was really fantastic. Um, so, um, I think... Is this something you would have anticipated beforehand? I don't think we were under any illusion that Camino would divide audiences. Um, and, you know, because I think partially we knew that there would be some people who were coming because they were coming to see the next class menagerie, having no idea that Tennessee had such a free floating, really sort of fever dream in his canon. So the people who sort of came to see the fever, to, to, who actually knew something about the play, and this is one of the things I've learned from this mm -hmm. process, um, probably were better prepared um, to, to get what they got. The people who thought, I'm going to see Glass Menagerie or Streetcar or something, I think were horrified. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at the lack of linear storytelling and um, the fragmentary nature of yeah. episodic, etc., etc., which is something we do a lot at Boston Court, so, but I think that the the playwright confused them, perhaps. Hell, hell yeah. hath no fury like an audience deceived. Indeed. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, did you leave with questions? Um, Very proud. You have to distinguish. <laughs> you are distinguished. Your audiences, they reported the most questions yes. of all 18 theaters. <laughs> Um, you know, 
my question is sort of what do you put in the water? You know, what do you what do you do that, that you know, do you ascribe this to the demographic nature of your audience, of for example the education levels, or do you ascribe it to something that you do? I mean, why do we have so many unanswered questions? Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, well, I ascribe that partially, I ascribe it to two things, and some of this is as a result of me, of us having had the privilege of being in this survey. Um, I learned many things. I think play is genuinely um, challenging for any audience. So in this particular play, I think um, that makes more sense to me than it would have with many other plays that even we do at Boston Court. But also, I think that we didn't do enough to help audiences sort, clarify, contextualize all those things. And that's something I learned that I'm taking away from this very valuable survey. I have to say, and I'm sure anyone in the audience who's either a director or an artistic director will understand this, I'm terrified of writing program notes because so often they're quoted in reviews um, to our detriment that I got very, very shy of it. Um, but what this teaches me is that there has to be other ways to kind of help the audience, because I have experienced the difference between, we did an interesting production of Mother Courage. In the talk back, I could see people understanding all the choices that we made, which I think would have helped them. So we do a lot of talk backs, and we do a lot of what we call illuminations panels on various things. But there's nothing in the program to take away, so that's something I really learned is that and Clay and I had an interesting discovery thing about not wanting to give them answers, but what was really interesting is maybe we do a question, um, a question series in the program, and then it says, if you'd like to know what the director thought of these answers, uh, how the director would have answered these questions, click here or go to this web, you know, uh -huh. go to this place, so that you don't have to give them the answer while they're asking the question, but actually. Later, if they were interested in knowing kind of what the artistic impulse was, they could get that to you. So true. that was exciting. That's a really exciting thing. Fantastic. Um, so afterwards, did you discuss? So what's interesting here is that these figures for the audience, and by the way, these are audience for staff anticipated much higher levels of post-perform intense discussion that actually happened. <laughs> and, and if you think about these figures by the audience, they're about half the level of unanswered questions. So, and, and, and the statistic here, just so everyone's clear, is the percentage of audience members who reported an intense exchange afterwards. So not everyone who's reporting unanswered questions is having an intense exchange. I don't think we would necessarily expect them to, right? Uh, but I guess the question is, why did you hope more people would have an intense exchange, and, and does this reinforce what you just said? Well, obviously, I hope people would have an intense exchange because, because I think we're hoping to make an impact that stimulates the cultural conversation, I mean, I think that that's an unofficial part of our mission. So, you know, um, I don't, what I don't know, and I'd love help interpreting this result is, you know, was the level of bewilderment so much that they just gave up and didn't have a conversation? They're like, I don't know, never mind, you know? <laughs> um, or, you know, I, I, I actually don't know why I thought they'd talk about it more than they did. You know. So here's this, this thing, I can just hear the survey question. Was the plot so complicated that you just gave up? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's how I felt at the awkward the other night. Yeah. And I'll never be able to understand this, so I'm just going to... Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's, that's the thing, like, that's the inchoate question I don't know the answer to. You know, or it's right. just like they quickly called their babysitter and found out that their kid was growing up and that was right. the end of right. You know, I right. don't know. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm just going to fast forward through this because we need to move on. Musical Theater West. Thank you, Mel. Oh, um, sorry, I just also want to give you an opportunity before we move on. If there are other sort of findings or insights that you drew from this that you'd like to share with the audience. This is a really personal one, actually, which is that I think our expectation, apparently we actually were fairly good at predicting, except for that piece, fairly good at predicting what our audience's experience was going to be um, on any given show. Um, but I know I will just speak purely from inside myself. 
that the experience of, of getting the production up sometimes influenced my sense of how the audience would receive it. So, you know, when, when a production was difficult um, or challenging to achieve, that it sometimes made me feel slightly more jaundiced about how it would be received than perhaps it was. So that was just that's a, just a totally internal takeaway, you know, about not letting the experience of making right. it affect right. the experience of sharing it. You know? That's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Clay? Okay, Michael. All right. Can you tell me about so Michael? Michael Betts, and this was Jessica Kubzanski, by the way. Sorry, we forgot to introduce him. So, um, Michael, would you please tell us a little bit about Musical Theater West and these three shows that we surveyed? Okay, Musical Theater West has been around for 60 years. We're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. We're basically a CLO model, for those of you who know what that is. We, we produce musicals four to five a year um, uh, in a thousand seat house in Long Beach. Uh, the background on the show is cats. Do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> was, was, was this a, a pretty traditional cat? It was a very, very traditional cats. When we did cats on the uh, Broadway set, and that's how it was. Um, it, it's been it, the rights are really hard to get for uh, companies uh, around the LA area. So our patrons have been asking for it for about 15 years. We surveyed them once a year to see what they want to see. It was the number one. Uh, show on our survey for 15 years. So the fact that we finally got to do it made a lot of... Is it still number one? They just want cats to come no, back? No, I haven't it. Good luck. Um, Summer, Summer of Love uh, was a world premiere by writer Roger Bean, who wrote uh, The Marvelous Wonder Rats, which was at the Elmore Town for several years. It was based on the experience during the Summer of Love in the Haight-Ashbury, hippies, war, uh, drugs, and it... Uh, Sex. Used, sex, yes, kind of. Uh, it was a, it was a family-friendly hair, so um, it, it kind of glossed over the sex. But thanks, Neil. Um, it, it did use the catalog of the late '60s, uh, early to late '60s uh, music, music of the Mamas and Papas, Jefferson Airplane, etc. Uh, the Wedding Singer was also exactly what it sounds like. It was based on the. Uh, a, the Adam Sandler film that made fun of the, uh, the '80s and '80s culture. Everything from the Rubik's Cube to uh, the hair bands of the days. Great. So, um, so this is uh, one of the impact charts. This is just the key indicators of intrinsic impact. This is looking only at Wedding Singer with no filter. Um, and the, the blue line inside, I know this is a little hard to read, and I apologize. But um, the, So if you look at the two sets of dots, they, their one is centered on the other. So the blue line inside is um, the actual response from the audience. Um, the yellow line is what your staff predicted the responses would be. And I'm wondering if you, so, so um, we, we actually, it's interesting, so about 50% of cases staff overestimates and in 50% of cases staff underestimates just as a general rule. I mean, sometimes they hit it right on the money. But um, there do seem to be some trends, and you and I talked about this a little bit. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about Wedding Singer and what you're seeing here, and then also, you, you mentioned that, that you got this result right as you were doing season planning. I'm wondering if you can talk about what this result did for you. Absolutely. Well, um, with the exception of our executive director, the uh, rest of the staff tends to be of the same age group, and we were all kids of the 80s. So when we were talking about doing, uh, doing shows that would engage a younger audience, we really all kind of went, yeah, wedding soon is going to be great. Everybody's going to respond to it. So if you see how high the yellow is, we really <laughs> thought it was going to catch fire. It did. Um, it really didn't. Um, most of that, that had to do a lot with our subscription base that just simply didn't get it. And what we missed, um, and it came out in the in the after surveys, um, if did you get already explain that we, we had to survey people after the shows face to face. And the three sets of surveys that we did with different people, um, the, the focus groups. They focus each of the companies also did some focus groups to get some qualitative data to go along with all the numbers. Um, all three uh, were women of, of different ethnicities, but they were all women in their in their 60s. Uh, sorry, two of them were. One of them was a younger a younger group. But the the women reminded us that when in their particular age group that they were in, our, our subscribers' age, they were having kids during the 80s, and so they really didn't plug into 80s 80s culture. And we thought that oh yeah, our our audience was 
our audience is basically made up of 60 year olds and they were 30 in the in the 80s and so they're really going to plug in but they were child rearing years and so that it just didn't we didn't really think about that not not really captivating them in the way we expected um, as Clay said, we got all this data as we were planning the season, and we really took a hard look at what we were looking at, and we were looking at a lot of uh, a lot of newer titles, uh, and going back over our history with this data in place, we chose a much more traditional season next year. So we're we're not we were talking about everything from Legally Blonde to um, to uh, Shrek to the, the newer shows. And we ended up with a very traditional 42nd Street chorus line because that's kind of what came back, what our audience wants to see is it's the memory that uh, Clay brought up. We do very well with shows that um, bring people back to the memories that they had when they first saw the shows. And Musical Theatre West is a bit unique in that it's one of the only companies where I think the, the artistic validation impulse is so strongly aligned with your mission. And, and that's something that, that came out in some of the other results. So, um, this is uh, preparation numbers, and this again, no filter, but it's all three shows. Um, and so what you've got here is between 12 and 16% of your audience says that they're doing anything to prepare. This is much lower than, than kind of the average result, which the average result, as you remember, is 25%. So this is about half of that. I'm wondering, um, I know you have a huge subscription base. And they they also are less likely to prepare. But I'm also wondering if there are any other indicators for this. I mean, perhaps the kind of the knownness of the work, and also if that matters to you, or if you're trying to get people to prepare more. Well, I'll tell you that starting with the beginning of this season, we've actually instituted. I was talking to Jessica backstage. We actually have instituted. Uh, there's a study guide that is e-blasted to everyone before they come see the show. There's a reminder e-blast that goes out to everyone that says you have tickets to such and such a date. Well, that includes the, the program. It includes a study guide, an adult study guide that we, that we create in-house. It also, um, we also have started doing pre-show talks that uh, go for about 10 minutes before the show to, to give some insight into the show. And I'll tell you, it's really hard when you're doing a show like, uh, we just did Winter Wonderettes, which is another Roger Bean show. It was hard to talk about that we talked about it in terms of time period rather than show, and we're doing Forbidden Broadway coming up, but we've learned that people really, really want that insight um, into it, and it's grown from maybe 50 people when we were doing Hairspray and I to about 300 people come, and when the doors don't open right at 7.30 for technical difficulties or what have you, we have people literally say to our ushering staff, are they gonna open? I, I don't wanna miss the pre-show talk. They don't understand that they're gonna, they're gonna see it because the doors haven't opened yet. Okay. Um, do you have any other takeaways that you'd like to kind of highlight? Really, for us, it was the the staff not being really in alignment with, with our executive director and our artistic director sitting down and trying to figure out how we can be more in alignment with what our with what our patrons want. Because we were really, Rebecca had pointed out, that we were really kind of out of alignment. So it's really made us really sit down and listen. And we were surveying before, and now we're surveying a little more aggressively. Because we really we can't, especially being a nonprofit musical theater company, we can't function without that give and take from the audience. I don't think anyone can. Right? But great, great. All right, um, let's move on to Bill, and then um, after Bill does his thing, we'll ask all of you some questions to just kind of close. So um, this is Bill Schroeder from South Coast Rep. Bill, could you talk a little bit about South Coast Rep and these three shows that that we surveyed with you? Um, South Coast Rep is in its uh, 48th season. We do 13 main stage production, three for uh, young audiences, and then the other nine are heavily um, new play, new play development, world premiere, West Coast premiere. Um, and I'm, let's just start with how oh, we perform in three different spaces. Uh, in, you know, Midsummer Night's Dream, what was different about this production, the reason we put it up to for survey is because it it wasn't a traditional Midsummer Night's Dream. The, the director had um, a concept in mind, the biggest concept of which is the fairies were evil, evil, nasty little things. Yeah. And as the as the lovers ran through the forest, he stripped their clothes off and you know made other things out of them. And he um, brought in elements of parkour and acrobatics. Uh, uh, into the storytelling, and you know there was a giant hardcore wall 
where the people would climb up and bounce off of, and, and the fairies had kind of some really wonderful acrobatic, interesting stuff. The, uh, the, the time frame was, you know, the lovers were kind of 40s and the mechanicals were kind of 50s, um, and the royalty was kind of like modern day royalty. Um, but visual spectacular, visually sumptuous in every possible way. Um, so that's why we chose that. Completeness is uh, kind of a boy meets girl romantic comedy. Boy is a computer scientist. Girl is a molecular biologist. And if they weren't just so damn neurotic, they might get together. Um, and it had uh, elements of uh, uh, like meta theater type elements in it. Uh, where uh, as the relationship starts to take off, he offers to write a, com a computer program for her that helps her uh, narrow down her variables for her research on yeast cells. Um, and, 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 and he writes something, and it looks like it's actually going to solve something that's called the traveling salesman problem. Um, and, and, it, and he becomes the talk of the uh, the university and it it's working and their relationship is starting to work and then something goes terribly wrong uh, the set uh, for it was kind of like a big transformer you had glass walls and metal walls and drawers and things that would that that could transition a a, a science lab into a bedroom you know transformers it was amazing looking. Uh, but in the middle, as, as the computer program was breaking down, the set breaks down, the power goes out, and the actors break the fourth wall and address the audience for about three minutes, and then it gets back up on its feet again. Uh, so that was something to look at and, and, to, and to measure. And then Three Days of Rain, you know, the Richard Greenberg drama uh, that asked the question, Do, can we ever really know our parents? And in the first act, we, we uh, meet the children, and they're trying to sort out the father's legacy, and the father's, uh, the father's a very enigmatic um, architect. And uh, there's much consternation over who will get Janeway House, his prize design. And, uh, and it doesn't work out the way they think it's going to. In the second act, we see the, the creation of Janeway House and all of the elements, the personal relationship elements between the two men who are partners building the house and the woman that they both love. Great. So um, so this is uh, all of them, uh, all three shows, including staff responses. This is um, unanswered questions. Um, and and uh, you, as, as with Jessica, um, assumed that you, oh no, actually, this is the reverse, right? No, you, you, the staff assumed the staff assumed that you would have more questions than um, than the audience actually had. But you did have, and it sounds like from that plot synopsis, I understand why um, you did have a higher percentage of questions for completeness. Um, do you do you, as a rule, try and anticipate questions? Is there is there a way that you try and engage people in terms of the amount of questions they're going to have, given that you thought that two thirds of the audience probably would have them? Um. Yes and no, uh, to an extent. I, I mean, there are certain things that obviously for artistic reasons around completeness, in order for the meta theatrical moment to work and for people to really doubt that the play was breaking down, it was forbidden to be revealed. It was forbidden to let scripts out of the building into uh, critics or writers' hands beforehand. And it was all uh, based on Itamar Moses, the playwrights, um, requests. Uh, so we did not violate those requests or that trust. Um, and then and we were also asked afterwards, uh, you know, in, in talkbacks, and there's generally only two talkbacks during the run of the show, uh, there, there were a lot of questions about that. In the uh, open-ended, there were a lot of questions about that. Uh, in retrospect, I do wish there had been more of a way to talk about it because I think the satisfaction level with the show would have been higher. Um, so this one, this is actually a composite of two graphs because the, the so the red dots are the response of your audience to the question 
to what extent did anything about the performance offend you or make you uncomfortable? And um, this is a really interesting question um, that some some theater companies were like, I don't, I don't want to ask that. And some of them very much wanted to understand that. Um, this is broken out by age cohort, and then the green dots that float above are, are what your staff thought the responses were going to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I, this is not, this is, this is a very interesting phenomenon that happens in almost all cases where people ask this question. The, the staff believed that their audience was going to be much more easily offended than they were. Huh. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about why, especially for completeness, but across the board, you expected the, them to have a, a kind of a offensive or, or be, be offended or uncomfortable, and also um, how, how that not being the case is maybe augmenting things within the organization at all. Um, in, com in completeness, there, there was nudity, male and female frontal nudity, and several instances of it. Um, and we don't have a great track record uh, with that. Uh, when there is frontal nudity, we do get a number of complaints. Um, and I think the staff was hung up on that, and I think they were hung up on uh, the, the meta theater aspect and to what extent would they find that somewhat offensive like we had ripped them off you know we're not giving them a perfect production that they really bought into it um, what's interesting about that is in, in the focus groups um, you know I'm not trying I'm trying real hard not to come out and say so what do you think of the nudity <laughs> and, um, and, and the thing that uh, in one focus group for that play uh, that, that I was in, there was no resistance to the nudity because they felt it was justified and it was appropriate. Yes. And in the other one, the same thing, although they didn't hit it quite as hard in the other one, and it actually got, I still, I can see her face. She was a guest. She was there because someone had invited her to be there. And uh, she doesn't go to much theater. And she's, her question was, uh, it wasn't really a question, it was, I don't understand why the man wasn't erect. <laughs> in, in, in that situation, he would have been erect. Um, there you go. Yeah. I, the one thing I want to, to look at really briefly here is that your younger audiences are the most likely to report being offended or uncomfortable. And I'm, I'm, now, one thing about this question, and this is um, Alan has a slide earlier where he talks about specificity of language. So, um, offended can mean a lot of things, and uncomfortable can mean a lot of things. And this is one case, wouldn't you say, where the language got in the way of what we were actually trying to get at, because. Um, uh, in this case, you could either be offended, um, for example, with Three Days of Rain, you could be offended by some sort of architectural reference that you as an architecture person think is inappropriate, or you can be offended because someone swore on stage, or you can be offended because the person next to you is snoring. And all of those things can mean offended, or if the person is leaning on you, that can also mean uncomfortable in a way that we weren't quite getting at. Um, but I, it is interesting, consistently, your youngest cohort is the most likely to report being uncomfortable. I'm wondering if, um, if that is reflective of anything you know about your audience. Um, not, not necessarily. It is reflective of something I suspect about our audience, which is that um, a lot of the younger people are um, coming to these plays with adults. And that it, might, it might also be that they're not comfortable with nudity with an adult next to them. Right. That's or great. with their teacher there. You know, um, heavy student group. Heavy student group and everything, whether it's new or not, you just make sure we're always heavy with student group. Um, but I do think that uh, based on anecdotal evidence and comments, that the, uh, the, the that, that, especially that high school group right now, they understand what shock value is. And they're very quick to put things into the shock value box. And I noticed that uh, it, it, in the core of the book, it has all the stats. And young people, on average, well, not on average, young people responded with a wider range of emotion to things than older people did. And I think that's just normal. I think when you're 
up till you're 25, you're just, it's great, it's horrible. You know, there's not a lot of gray area in between. Um, and, and I think that comes out too in how you feel about risk. And because you don't necessarily stop and, and think, why is that risk there? Why have they taken that risk? Uh, you don't intellectualize it, you just emotionally vomit on it. <laughs> Do you have any other remarks about the results before we have a bigger discussion? Um, I, I, the, the, uh, the comparison to how our staff felt and how the audience felt on things uh, has been very, very useful. Um, the staff really, in aesthetic growth, thought that we were going to rock their world on all three. <laughs> and we didn't quite rock their world. And, and I think that's really important to know because uh, marketing-wise, if you think you're going to rock their world, you might be overselling it in your marketing. You might be making a brand promise you can't deliver on. Um, and and, and you, have, you wrap it all around into one big package. What they really want is plot. They really want plot. They don't really want you to tell them about the significance and the standing of that playwright um, or that designer. They really want to understand what plot they're getting into. And so I do think we tend to overshoot it sometimes. That's great. All right, Alan. Uh, great, so I just want to open this up to everyone here. Uh, you've now kind of gotten the summary and you've heard three great um, examples of how of some of the, the types of results that, that it comes with this data. And so I've just posed some questions here um, for kind of big picture reflection. And the first one is, uh, did you find qualitative or quantitative data to be more useful? And I need you to ask you just to just share the microphone. But uh, any of you have kind of a reflection on the relative value of quantitative versus qualitative? And qualitative data would be the uh, open-ended responses. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, the one thing about the qualitative data is I was in the room, so I could use it right away. So I, I don't. I, so I acted on it. Anyway, you know, uh, as best we could. We often reinvent messages, even during the course of the play, because we feel like maybe they're not landing right, or they're not serving the work right. Um, but to say one was more valuable than the other, no, I can't. Um, I, I return to both. Okay. Others? I have, I have board and artistic staff that clearly speak in two different languages. Mm -hmm. So we use them. We, <laughs> so we use them. We use them together to, uh -huh. to prove different points. Does that make sense? We have the people who need the numbers, and that was extraordinary. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. We resisted surveys for a long time, and so all of it's valuable. It was. I think. It's, I think it's all valuable. I, I can't say that I would only like to have the numbers, or I'd only uh, like to have the open-ended uh, question. I mean, what, what I've seen with artistic, with artistic folks generally is attaching premium to the qualitative data because of the nuance and the richness, and that the quantitative numbers are kind of subject to interpretation, and there's some questions about believability that I hear back. So any any of you have any kind of reflections on qualitative versus quantitative? Yes. Where's the line that we might cross and become the old uh, the gold, uh, the old globe, where a money person is making the artistic decisions based on what he perceives the audience wants? Where is the line in there uh -huh. that we might cross yeah. following this kind of model, which is valuable, but I don't know where. That line is. That's, that is precisely the core issue underneath all of this. Is in, in what is the role of audience data in an artistically driven organization? And I, I hope that you all will go from here thinking about where that line is for you and your organization. Because clearly it's very different amongst our three uh, panels today. Jason, I don't know, Jason Lowe with who um, is with NNPM, the National New Play Network, 
wrote something really thoughtful about this as a cautionary tale, like we've, we've gotten all these results, and if what it does, I mean, I know for me personally, if it were to, if it were to somehow diminish the choice of art over commerce, I mean, speaking as the artistic director and my executive director is in the audience, um, but I mean, I, I can't let it, I absolutely cannot let it. I hope it informs me and teaches me about how to do it best, but if for one second I let it take us away from the artistic integrity, but I'll also say I have a 99 seat house. I don't have 800 seats for, you know what I mean? And I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, I just want to quickly respond. So as a service organization and as a group that kind of focuses a lot of energy on advocacy, we are we are interested in we're interested in that question. We're also interested in some of the stuff that might lead to asking that question. Um, in, in terms of, of Jason's post, which it, or his email, which is very very well thought out. Um, at its core, he, what he's worried about is the is kind of the implications of if suddenly artistic directors are, are being asked to score themselves at like a 3.6 this year, then are we going to expect them to get a 3.7 next year? And that's a mis that I mean, not that people won't try to use it that way, but that is a misuse of this information. This information is really meant to be about um, allowing the artistic director in the same way as you would allow a marketing director to understand what's what's influencing their level of success and to measure their level of success um, in, a, in a way that will allow them to maybe augment the parts that are external to the creation of the art to make that art resonate more. I think one of the reasons that a stage got involved is to answer your question, it has to do with individual missions. Right? What is the mission of your, what is the unique mission of your organization to deliver artistic uh, works into, into the community? And so we wanted to begin to have that dialogue and have tools around this language um, in a market that's as saturated as ours, to begin to differentiate between one another and have those conversations on a one-on-one -one basis. There were at least two comments. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say that's one of the concerns that I've been tracking, like you guys across the country. Sounds creepy, but it's not. Um, like it's kind of a conversation that's been happening, and I've been seeing marketing staffs really embrace this. But I don't feel like I've seen the same level of engagement from artistic staffs. And I actually think that this is an artistic tool. I think that marketing can you know, um, amplify the work, but I think it's an artistic tool. And I would actually say that it has to do with expectation and the contract you're building with the audience. So I think you know, if I were going to receive, like if there's a play that I believe in that didn't have a big intrinsic impact, which again, I think is our mission, right? Um, I would look at, okay, how am I communicating about that play? What did we not realize on the stage that it didn't have an impact? I wouldn't say, like, oh, I guess we shouldn't have chosen that play. I would say, you know, what is the way that we can do this work better so that we can have, they can have the impacts that we believe it should have? Thank you. Mine is, I think it did with this point. I was curious, when I came away, so I may have missed a little bit of this. But I was curious about all the data about how staffs, what staff thought people's reaction would be, whether people had questions, whether that then led to an intense conversation or not. But I was never sure whether you ever asked the audiences, and I'm making an assumption that it might differ from theater to theater, but I'm curious whether the audiences think leaving with unanswered questions is a good thing or a bad thing, and whether having an intense conversation is a good thing or a bad thing, a success or not. I have a you know deep held assumption that those things are good and that Theater is successful when you leave with financial questions, but I'm making assumptions as an artistic staff member that that in fact sure. my audience feels that's a good thing. And I wasn't sure from the, the results you presented whether you went that step to ask the audience whether when they buy a ticket and go to a theater, they want financial questions. Right. And, that they, and that's a mark of success, or is that a mark of we let them down and fail? That's really interesting. And I, sorry, just one quick thing. Oh, wait, so that, think... no, was that, that didn't get um, No, sorry. We did, we did not. Um, I mean, we have tested and tested these protocols in terms of their understandability. You know, do people understand the question? Can they answer it? But we never asked audience members. But I think all our decisions about our programming using these things as a tool are in a way based on what we believe right. the audience and us consider right. a success. I mean, right. That, that I can well, ask, and I'm sure all of you will be able it's great to have unanswered questions. But who knows, they well, think that's one of the things that's sort of speaks to the whole questions around engagement. And I'll just say that as a field, 
we're very, we have a lot of work to do still to understand how different audience members like to engage. And, and I know that some people prefer not to jump into and argue about meaning, but prefer to, to go quietly from the venue and reflect privately. And then maybe days later, begin to talk about it. it. It's the same reason why at talkbacks, you see there's some people sitting in the back who aren't ready yet to verbalize, but they sure want to listen to other people and learn and they are very much engaged. So I think the best answer to your question is there are different modalities of engagement and we have to be very careful not to impose our value judgments about how we like to engage on audience members, because there's so many different modalities of engagement. But back to your question about impact assessment in general and the, arti the, the blurry line between audience data and artistic vision. For me, this is, this is about accountability and choosing, you know, opting for a higher level of accountability for artistic outcomes. And, wanting to understand how your artistic choices are received and how different choices affect audiences and thereby kind of learning about your latitude as an artistic artistic leader and and that's for me that's about accountability you know for me the, the hallmark of a professional in any field is welcoming critical feedback on your work. Right? It's hard as hell. It's never easy to get good criticism. But without it, you know, my work as a researcher, I can't get better at what I do unless people criticize my work. So I learned over the years to invite it. And for me, that's partly what this is about. It's about inviting thoughtful criticism of our artistic work and receiving it in a good spirit. I just want to start by saying thank you for the, the, the work you've done is incredible. Um, thank you. I wanted to quote uh, at the beginning of the book, the portion of song and new things that play the uh, You quote Diana Rice and you say, We have ignored the larger part of society for so long that they no longer think that we're important. They have evidence that we're not important in their lives because they haven't been born. Nobody that they know has been born, and they've all and they're all going to And I'm wondering if a larger question that we need to really address is all of these questions and this um, data is about people who already have this as a part of their culture. And is really the focus is it on really about the same gender minority. And those people who don't who don't make this a part of their lives. I think our subscribers are, are, have already told us that this is a critical part of their experience as a human being. But I'm concerned about what are the what's the culture of America that doesn't see this as a part of their human experience, and when will they begin to uh, believe that? So that's that's my concern, and I really hope that our theaters are really looking at addressing it because that's ultimately uh, we need to focus on it. And I know people don't like to hear that because we're, we're, we're so right. you know, indebted to our subscribers. But ultimately, those people who are not attending or don't see this as a part of their cultural experience as an American or just their, their livelihood, I'm concerned about those people. Well, let's thank you for that. And let's make some distinctions about what is relevant and not relevant. But I uh, remember a lively discussion with Molly Smith at her mistake. I was thinking, I say, Molly, why don't you email your subscribers once a month and tell them what is the best drama to watch on television? It's like, oh, we can never do that. Well, why not? It's drama. And it's actually how most Americans experience drama. And the percentages of Americans who experience drama on television is huge. So I, I don't think we can say that Drama isn't a part of American life because it is manifest in, in, in very predominant ways. 
But going to a live theater, going to a theater and seeing a live drama is a part of that ecosystem, but not the dominant part. So I wish there were a way that theaters could make connections to drama on television. I know shoot, shoot me for saying this, but I wish on Monday nights in theaters like this we could drop a screen and show, I invite people to come see Mad Men. Or another great you know, series and have it be curated and have, it, have there be social interaction and intellectual engagement. And, and, and just show people that you know, live theater is a part of this larger ecosystem of drama, which is an essential part of American culture. So I think there are ways to, to make those connections. That being said, there are real barriers around theater going, uh, particularly around setting and venues that, that certain Certain cohorts of people don't identify with purpose-built theaters. And there's research, I won't even go into it, that shows that, that, that in California, in certain regions, people of color use theaters at less than half the rate of white people. And it's really provocative to ask why. So anyway, it's a big, wonderful issue you bring up. Uh, yes? Do you, do you think your study supports the conversation that's going on in a lot of regional theaters? That uh, work has to be star-driven or director-driven uh, in order for us to maintain our subscribers? Yeah, um, does work need to be increasingly star-driven or director-driven in order to attract audiences and satisfy subscribers. Sorry, I'm just What giant you just played stuff with Ham. Yeah. Um, do you have a, a response to her question? Yes. Uh, I was on tour with a show called Twelve Angry Men to Ramza and we went through regional theaters across the nation. And as far as subscribers are concerned, they would come out traditionally and then spread the word about how what a dramatic show they just saw, and how well done it was. And that spread the word, and other people were sold out. The place was sold out all over the country. I think what you've done in this survey is so appropriate for this audience here, in understanding how audiences participate. And what, I, what comes to mind is that as much as your subscribers like the traditional cats or the big shows, they loved what we did in 12 Angry Men. They sat back and they thought about what was going on. And then we have, once a week, uh, we have a talk back session. And maybe 100 people would show up, depending on the size of the audience, which went from 1,200 to 3,900. So I think what you've done is so informative and, and right on the nose. And I appreciate that. But I've experienced all of that. And you're right on target. I can only say, keep up the good work for everyone. So, any other comments about this question about star? I can comment for a second. Diane, I think it's not so much star driven or, or director driven at this point, at least for us, it's title driven. If there's not some familiarity with the title, then we lose out. I mean, if you see in New York right now, a lot of the musicals are based on films and things so that the audience walks in with the pre existing. Would, would Wicked be as successful as it is if it didn't have that connection to one of the great fairy tales of, of America? And, and I would I would suggest that the title actually reads a story there, which is which the data bears that out. That the this is not to say that star driven does not generate more ticket sales than non star driven. It depends highly on the production. But the thing that seems to actually matter most in terms of driving impact, as opposed to sales, but impact is how familiar people were with the story before they came in. Um, there's another study that actually came out while we were doing this that um, the media nicknamed the spoiler study, um, which basically um, did, they did research and they spoiled a bunch of stories for people and then had them read the stories and then asked them how, how satisfied they were reading them. And, and the people who actually knew the basics of the plot, including, for example, plot twists, um, actually said they experienced the story in a more impactful way than people who didn't. 
which is not to say that you should reveal every aspect of your show, but the, the thing we've been telling people across the country is um, maybe don't use that enigmatic marketing image that someone, your, your graphic designer, thinks is just so awesome, and instead use something that might actually indicate to people what the show is about. <laughs> is there, you, on this, would you say that the, the star thing, or the familiar artist thing, I mean, that's, that's related to the I know the title, I know the story, I've seen the show before thing, right? Because so we, we, split it up. So we split out, we split out okay. cast, story, and playwright. And the story was more impactful than the other two. But familiarity with any of them. The familiarity with anything else. And stuff. And do, to what extent do you think, though, that that, that might be? Because I have this question too. To what extent could that be causal? That there weren't a lot of stars in the productions that were surveyed. Well, well, there 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 were like five, I don't know five or six shows that had stars in them. Uh, and they were sold better, and they're, and, uh, uh, but generally, I, I ran the stats on star-driven versus non-star-driven, and there were not big impact differences. Because I, I mean, because the one thing that just kept echoing is the word, from, you know, as I was reading, is familiarity, familiarity, familiarity. And so, you know, quite frankly, I'm, I'm working a lot of times with a play that's never been on stage before, and I will repeat that plot in four emails in a row to them over four weeks, leading to them walking into the door in hope in hopes that then then that when they see the play, they will recognize the right. plot from that. Right. That's, that fulfills the contract. This gentleman's had his hand up for um, I just wanted to speak to the the uh, this issue of or the the idea that familiarity with the title um, uh, is a driver of audiences because I think you know if you look at Hollywood over the last five, ten years, you've seen a similar thing um, come into play there. You've seen a, a resurgence in remakes, franchises, films made out of novels. You just had the Hunger Games blow up the uh, you know the, the, the weekend box office on the weekend. And and I think that, that that it speaks more to a trend, and this is what I'd be really interested to find data on. It speaks more to a trend of um, of stories jumping across media, where now you have an audience, uh, of, and, and the audience coming up that, that, that I'm a part of, it's younger than me, that is less interested in how they're getting the narrative. They're used to so many different streams of information coming in. Um, Text-based, image-based, audio-based, uh, location-based, and and you have this, so, so you have this sort, sort of like multi-stream user who really, I think, wants something to tie it all together. I think that when you're able to tie that together through a narrative, all these different forms, you, you relieve their anxiety in a way. And, and so this is something that, that our company's experimenting with and, and doing, where you know, rather than just treating new media or treating these other forms of media as a, as a way to boost the marketing for the play, Tying it all into a single package, um, and 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 we're we're rewriting our mission. We're going through a whole like complete overhaul right now to be able to do this in terms of you know who we're working with, who we're hiring. And um, if anybody wants a, a clear example of this, New Paradise Laboratories in Philly yeah. is doing some really interesting work yeah. that that uses this. I'm taking plays within Facebook. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I'm aware of an opera opera company in Sweden that has characters from the opera. Fictional characters write blogs, and thousands of people read these blogs. It's just another channel of content, you know, narrative that complements the live event. I, I will just say that uh, we have spent a lot of time. I mean, because we do many, many new plays or titles that people are unfamiliar with. What's been interesting for us is actually it's about getting people to trust that they're going to have an experience without knowing a good experience, without knowing what the experience is. And, um, you know, just really quick anecdotally, like our first couple seasons we do plays no one had ever heard of, we have 20 people in the house, then we did a re envision with Dia, suddenly we had a full house, we're like, see, they like Boston Court now, then the next play was another play they'd never heard of, and we were back down to 20 people. Um, and finally, a couple of years ago, we did at the Cell Ray, um, as a rolling world premiere, and it was a season of four world premieres, and it was our biggest houses ever on 
we extended all four of those shows, and there was a four, it was four world premieres and no one had ever heard of it, which said to us, so they're starting to trust that they're not going to know the work, but they're going to have a quality experience, and they're willing to take the ride now, you know, which took a lot of investment and trust for a long time to get to that. You know? what, about, what about the playwright being recognition? Because obviously we saw Paula as somebody that didn't know. I don't think they knew any of the other three playwrights. Okay. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, one more question, and then we, uh, we need to close. That's what I, I just wanted to talk about. Um, you know, the X factor of like extreme excellence. I, um, yeah. Right now, I don't work in Center Theater, but right now, waiting for the dough with no stars and a play that I think people would have a very tough time saying what the story was. I think it's doing fantastically well, it's selling fantastically well. And um, I think that's because, not because Waiting for Godot is successful, not because there's stars, but there's a buzz of excellence. And that's what happened, I think, with Boston Court. After a period of time, people trust that there would be excellence at that theater. So, that, I mean, I wonder if that was added into the mix anywhere. Yeah, that's uh, the unmeasurable, truly the unmeasurable. Um, should we speak green? Uh, okay, great. Um, so I, I thank you. Thank you for that discussion. Um, and, and the whole point is that there, there are some real big philosophical issues uh, underneath this work. You know, it, it's all kind of be careful what you wish for and don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. But, you know, because if you, your audiences are more than willing to give you critical feedback on your work, and the real question is what are you going to do with it if you get it? And, and do you really want to know that? How often do you want that kind of feedback? You know, do you want it for every play? You probably, you know, we're learning don't want it. Survey every, you know, play, but, but occasionally. And I have this wild hypothesis that you could actually do impact assessment work as a donor program, because there are probably cohorts of donors who would love to sort of fancy themselves as critics and would pay you they pay you for the opportunity to serve on a panel that gives regular feedback, but that's just a wild, a wild idea. Anyway, um, I'm going to close now just for a few minutes um, about kind of the big picture, and then Clay will bring it home from his perspective. Um, why, you know, kind of why, why engage audiences? Um, and you know, we've been doing satisfaction surveys for a long time. You know, on a rating of one to ten, how much did you like the toilets? How much did you like the lobby refreshments? You know, how satisfied are you with parking? You know, we've been doing that for a long time, and that's all great. That's all extrinsic stuff. And I think satisfaction research on extrinsic stuff is great, but if you're going to be asking about the art, we don't really need to be doing satisfaction research. We need to be doing impact assessment, because it's actually the same thing. It's just that in, in, in the original, uh, original study from 2007, we actually asked satisfaction questions and did the impact questions, and, and it was essentially the same, same, highly correlated. So, so in reference to art, we can ask about satisfaction. But we just uh, uh, did some research for the San Francisco Foundation, uh, and there's a book you can't see here on the on the screen, "Making Sense of Audience Engagement." We wrote a paper. You, which you can download from my website for free, it's on the home page, uh, which is wolfbrown.com, uh, making sense of audience engagement. And we really think critically about the whole, what we call the arc of engagement, all the stuff that arts groups are doing before, during, and after arts experiences to engage audiences. And at the end of that, this is a diagram from that paper, of kind of looking at um, the whole cycle, starting with marketing. And this was your question uh, earlier. You know, marketing is the beginning of the audience engagement cycle because the marketing message is often the only contextualization that people have. And then there's some decision to attend. Then you have an opportunity to contextualize, right? And often uh, it, that comes down to the last 24 hours. And when people kind of tune in, and often the last few hours, and often the last few minutes, 
You know, there's this moment right before an event starts where you've got an opportunity to give them a little information. And the question you have to ask yourself and your colleagues is, as a matter of institutional philosophy, how much context do you insist people have or not? Yeah. Or not. Uh, the, uh, the example I gave is the Martha Graham Company several years ago. Uh, recorded an introductory video to Appalachian Spring, the dance. They had an archival videotape of Martha Graham chatting with Aaron Copeland. It was a five minute video, and when they showed it, the audience response was categorically different. At the, at the Hollywood Bowl, actually, is where this experiment took place. And now they require it to be shown. Because as a matter of institutional philosophy, they insist that their audience have that context before that piece. So it's just, it's just a question. Contextualization, there's a whole other session to be had, which I hope you'll add to your schedule, about the, uh, the um, pluses and minuses of adding interpretive assistance on top of an arts event, allowing people to tweet. Right? Um, projecting super titles at the opera is generally accepted. Why don't we do that at the theater? Why don't we use infrared headsets to allow people to have uh, someone whispering in their ear about, you know, why do you have to be blind to get an audio description? <laughs> I mean, don't answer that. There's a, there's a lot of juicy issues around interpretive assistance at arts events. Afterwards, meaning making, everything we do, we've seen the connection between meaning making and impact is very substantial. And audience feedback is an inflection point in that engagement cycle. And that's why I see feedback, whether it's surveying or focus groups or interviewing people, you know, whatever you can afford to do with your resources of inviting critical feedback, because it's not just about taking data, it's an investment in your audience's aesthetic development. Because you're, in a way, you're teaching them and valuing their critical reaction, which for me is all about building this trust that you, you, you've managed to do so beautifully. So that's really, that's really my uh, kind of closing remark, is to, is to think about audience feedback and think about you know, investment in your audience and also it's about holding yourself to a higher standard. All right, so we're almost done. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about practical applications. This has come up a lot um, as we've been to all of the cities. We've been, we've been talking with lots of groups of people and, and the practical application of this work um, is, of course, that's our goal. We, don't, we didn't just do this so that we could have this sit on a shelf somewhere. And there's a lot of practical application that we see coming out of it. Um, the most interesting one, or the, I guess the most germane one, the most immediate one, is checking impact against goals. Um, this is a bit of a touchy subject, as we've heard earlier, but the idea of um, allowing an artistic staff, and it is not forcing, it's allowing, allowing an artistic staff to have a context for how much they are succeeding at the goals that they've set out for a particular production, we think is incredibly valuable. We have all these interviews in the book with artistic directors, and they, they, they run the gambit between musical Peter West, who does pop, pop, popular musicals, to Jessica and, and Michael, who, of course, do incredibly difficult work in the way. And in all cases, there's an amazing attention to why a certain work is chosen in a season. And so the idea that you put all that attention in, but you don't actually have the feedback to know whether it's succeeding in a specific way, we'd like to change that. Um, you can also react immediately if impact is stifled. So, um, you know, if you if you get a bunch of comments uh, 24 hours after someone's seen the show and you're able to change your marketing materials or change your marketing message or change your engagement materials afterwards to address questions that seem to be causing problems in terms of impact, in terms of impact and uptake, then you can do that immediately. Um, you can create targeted pre and post engagement. And, and this is an interesting one, show profiles. So. Um, we talked earlier about the two productions of Ruin that had the different amounts of unanswered questions. Well, except for um, 
when you look at the five impact indicators across those two productions, they essentially have exactly the same profile. This is, this is not something that says anything really grand, but it does open up the possibility that a piece of art may actually have an inherent impact profile that could be passed along with it to future productions, for example. Or if you're doing a series of world premieres that you think are going to move on to other, show, uh, other venues, then you might be able to provide them with a packet of the type of questions they can expect to get. Or the word cloud of the emotions that those people might be, might be expected to have at the end. So that they can actually inform their um, marketing and their engagement materials in that way. Um, you can engage departments and boards. There's a, one, there's a kind of thread in a lot of the conversations we've had in the last few years of, of kind of a disconnect between marketing staff and artistic staff. And that it's not based on animosity, at least not in most cases. It is, in fact, just based on the fact that they speak different languages and they have different um, goals. And, and they shouldn't have different goals. Um, they should have the same goal, and, and hopefully they can use this to help articulate that. And then finally, just reporting out to boards um, and funders, things like that. Um, Alan has done a variety of different work in different countries around this, um, and, and other countries have kind of taken it on. The Australia Council has created a, a beautiful free resource for all of their major arts organizations around what they're calling artistic vibrancy, which is measuring the same type of stuff. Arts Council of England just um, awarded a very gigantic grant um, to um, an, art, an audience development corporation, right? To, um, to essentially create a bunch of tools um, to in part measure impact assessment and other um, vibrancy in the field. Um, and then uh, some foundations are getting in on this. They're very interested in this idea of people reporting on something other than numbers, other than economics. Um, which is kind of ironic since I think, at least in our case, we've thought for many, many years that all the funders wanted was the numbers. It turns out they were looking for something else. And then finally, the National Endowment for the Arts has actually commissioned Alan to do, um, do to translate this work into um, a, a survey that they'll be rolling out, ideally rolling out to all of their fundees over the next few years so that they can actually start reporting on impact assessment and impact of art to Congress soon. Yay! So, the goal was to take impact from very expensive to less expensive. We've done that by creating this online tool. It's now up and available if you are interested in doing this type of work. Um, the Duke Foundation's actually funded us four times on this work, which is amazing. And the most recent grant included um, money to subsidize up to 30 arts organizations um, to, to experiment with doing this work. So if you're interested in that, the important part is the email at the bottom. Just shoot me an email, we'll get you on the list, and we'll be, we're figuring out how to identify the, 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 those organizations that get to do that. But even if you don't get to do that, you can still take part. And I just wanted to close by bringing it back to Max. I like circles. So, um, so Max was the beginning of my artistic experience, but he wasn't the only one. Um, I met, I, I moved through my life having different artistic experiences, and they're the artistic experiences that led me from wanting to be a lawyer when I was a freshman in college, working in an arts service organization when I'm 30, and that led me from having an interest in communications to suddenly getting myself into some process that two years later generated a book. And, and that's all by way of saying that art actually changes our trajectories in our lives. And that what we do is actually really important because what it, what it ultimately does is it, it dictates where people move in the world. And that we need to keep that in mind and, and that we need to understand that impact leads to memories which leads to return, which leads to further impact, more memories, more return. And that this isn't esoteric. That if we can actually change the amount of impact we have on a person, then we can change the amount that they remember that experience. And that that memory can inform their future arts attendance, it can inform their future lives. I heard a story once about a woman who left a movie and divorced her husband. <laughs> Art can change you. <laughs> what we want to do is, is fill in the blanks so that we can see the entire trajectory of art and its impact on people because we can know more about the power of what we do. We can know more about the ability of art to transform, prove and improve our impact, make stronger, stickier memories. We can better explain our relevance to an increasingly large group of people who seem to believe we are irrelevant. We can bridge anecdote and numbers, and we can turn something that we thought was unmeasurable into something that can actually be measured. That's why we're excited about the court, and I hope you are too. Thank you.
survey is still yours out on the way out. Thanks so much. Thanks to all of our panelists.